There's Carl. Uh, did Maurice show you how to get the alert on for your uh, chat messages? Alert. What do you mean by how that? How do I get uh, alerts for chat? Oh, so you go to edit at the top. Edit, edit. Oh, okay. Preferences. Okay. And then you're going to get a box that says chat, and you're going to want to click on play the selected sound. Okay. And then uh, for uh, only if not viewing chat panel or always. I always for you you want to put always, and then the sound you can you can choose your sound from the drop down, and you can also test it. And then you hit OK or Apply, and then from that, then on, whenever you get a, someone type something in the chat, you'll get a notification. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Great. Am I the only one who can hear that? Yes. Okay. It shouldn't come through your microphone. Okay. Yeah, if you're running the meeting, you really need to have that turned on. Uh, I think there's also a setting for raise your hand. Uh, yeah, when somebody raises hand, that's in that same menu. Uh, the one selection at the one tab at the top is chat. The next one is participants, and you want to click raise hand. So that whenever somebody raises their hand, you'll get a notification on that too. Otherwise, with everything going on during a meeting, you might miss things. Yeah. Uh... I'm going to count on Carl to. Well, I don't know which which one of you is calling out raised hands. That's calling the hands. So I'm going to I leave think Billy does a good job of uh, seeing. She can see all the hands, so I don't. I don't usually call them out. I will send her a message. So, uh, Don, you got my email about the headsets to order as well. For you guys. I did. I haven't. Okay. I haven't ordered it yet, but I will. When I get okay. back to the office. And there's Director Collier. Was that a bow tie I saw? Oh, no, that's his headphones. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that's a new look. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. You're muted, Fred, if you're trying to talk to us. Good morning, John Carlo. Or something. Oh, he might be talking to other people. I was Good morning. saying, you, uh, you guys, we got that uh, the $35 million grant from HUD. Did you guys see that? So, no. Yeah, wow, the, great. For, the for, and what is that one for? Well, in those states. Uh, in the uh, Buckeye Willow neighborhood. Oh, great. That project was just approved recently, correct? Is that the one? Yeah, we had a, uh, they approved the choice neighborhood plan um, a little while a little while back. And uh, we've been waiting for the uh, grant announcement and uh, we got it full, full amount. With is that uh, uh, Marsha Fudge? City of Cleveland, she's the uh, she's at HUD now. Yeah, she's yeah. That's what I thought. Isn't doesn't she run HUD now? But the, yeah, yeah, she does. Mr. Bonazzi, how are you, sir? 
I'm doing well. How are you this morning? <laughs> I'm good, man. Good to see you. Good to see you as always. It's John Carlo. Good morning. How are you, sir? Good, and you? I'm good. You good. look very good comfortable. <laughs> Okay, Kyle, uh, Carl, I will leave this uh, meeting in your capable hands. I'll log off here and verify that the uh, YouTube stream is still going. So have a good meeting. Thanks, Maurice. Carl, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, all right. Everybody froze for a while there. Yeah, it looks like you were having some issues like low bandwidth or something. We got a lot of devices going here with my kids, so we're going to try to... Eh, give them the day off.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Julie, I think we have a quorum. Uh, uh, Freddie, do you want to read the preamble? Yes. Thanks I think we can, we can start whenever you're ready. It is 9 a.m. and this is the Cleveland Landmarks Commission meeting for Thursday, May 27, 2021. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law under COVID-19 emergency declaration, notice that this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting have the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Call in users can unmute by using star six. Slide please. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. We have provided a link to the meeting for those who wish to speak on a particular case via our website and email. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comment on a particular matter. Madam Chairwoman, the meeting is yours.
Thank you. We would like to call the May 27th Landmarks Commission meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Pettit, please call roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Anderson. Here. Ms. Bailey. Here. Mr. Bonesi. Here. Mr. Kalikia. Mr. Kalikia, are you here. here? I'm here. Thank you. Director Collier. Here. Mr. Dreyer. Here. Councilman Jones. Mr. Strickland. Here. Mr. Tarasic. Here. Ms. Trot. Here. We are also joined today by staff members Ava Schmidt and Carl Brunges, who is hosting the meeting. Uh, he will be advancing the slides for the applicant. Uh, we also have two new representatives from the law department, uh, Kevin Roberts and Nathaniel Hall. I don't know if they've joined us yet, but they will be our new law representatives at the commission meetings. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Excellent, thank you. We'd like to uh, welcome everyone, and it's nice to see everyone again, even though it may be continue to be virtual. We will begin to, with our certificates of appropriateness. Um, we would like to ask the, uh, applicants to uh, use the raised hand function, unmute your microphone, and then identify yourself and tell us about your project. The first certificate of appropriateness is located 11300 Hessler Road, new construction. We have uh, Mark F, I believe, with a raised hand. You can unmute your phone, uh, your connection, and tell us about your project. Uh, I think Jessica uh, Wobig is going to speak first. Maybe she's muted still. Well, we'd ask for the applicants to speak first, and we will open up uh, the conversation with the public after that. Okay. Now, Je so Jessica is, is also for the applicant. All right, well, project representatives that we have are uh, Richard Marin, Russell Baruch, Daniel Sirk, Ava Sirk, um, as the four that we have listed here. Are any of those present today? Yes, uh, Richard Marin, Daniel, and Eva are here. Are you? Are you are you going to let us show slides, or, or should we just wait for? Uh, the developer to show more slides first, because this is a presentation focused on the project. I believe um, we did state that there will not be any additional uh, in slides shown besides the presentations that have been submitted um, related to the pro uh, project. Okay, um, so are you asking us to go first uh, for Hessler, or do you want the developer to go first? Um, we would like the developer to tell us about the project. Not all uh, commission members were present at the last presentation, um, but the majority were. So if you could give us uh, oversight related to the project again, tell us the specifics that you've changed since your last presentation to now, and then we'll move forward with that. We will uh, talk, We will come to uh, the period of the presentation after that's complete, where we will at, open up the floor to other people related to the project. Okay. Okay. Um, the presentation will be done by Dan Sirk. Uh, we have a few changes, but most of this is very similar to what you have seen before. So, Dan, could you go ahead? Okay. And thank you, Carl, for advancing the slides. Uh, Daniel Sirk, architect, 1322 Old River Road, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, as you can see on the screen, you have the focus of where the property is located uh, adjacent to Ford near Euclid on Hessler. Please advance, Carl. This is part of this. This application before you is broken into four parts. Um, 
the one of the parts is the 1981 building, which was uh, purchased from UCI. And this building is going in for interior renovations only to um, just spruce up the kitchens and the existing um, utilities within this, uh, with this building. The next slide, Carl, please. The next applicant uh, is the 1975 Ford building. Again, this building is going through an interior retrofit and upgrade to kitchens, bedrooms, um, electrical upgrades. And the one item before you today, if you can go to the next slides, Carl, would be um, the exterior um, color colors for the painting of this building. Um, that's the one impact um, before this committee today. And after multiple uh, selections and some support from Carl, we've uh, come up with the, this. The owner has chosen this pathway for, in essence, refreshing the existing colors from the palette that's available um, that was provided to us. And this was presented to the corridor, and Kim Scott indicated that this had uh, garnered approval at that level. Next, Carl. This, the next is uh, 11300 Hessler. This is a proposed micro building on this site. And this is a view behind the 1975 building showing the, the uh, area uh, for, the, for the proposed project. Moving along, Carl. This is a, uh, a view of the entire street context of Hessler Street. Um, as you can see, um, and as was challenged by UCI, was to uh, complete the, the fabric of the architecture of the street by infilling the one vacant area uh, behind 1975. The next slide um, indicates the existing stock of buildings um, with multi-story apartment buildings um, highlighted and then uh, smaller single and detached single family or multifamily uh, residentially in blue. The next slide is uh, existing context. I'm assuming everyone on this uh, presentation is familiar. I have them here for reference. Carl, we can go through these. Uh, you can stop here, Carl. This is uh, what the fourth uh, uh, item on the agenda for the board, and that is the existing garage at the rear of the 1975 property. Um, that we presented you for quarter, and it's uh, pretty much the similar site plan to what was presented last time to. Um, this body. One of the items I would notice note is the uh, setbacks that we worked hard to obtain um, earlier in the design, and that was to ease off the connection of the building to the existing uh, three-story duplex building adjacent to the property to the east, and in introducing an additional property line to the west, which we may discuss earlier because I know there was a lot of questions about why there is not a window along that elevation. Next slide, please. This is the proposed landscaping plan for the area um, to enhance the connection from the Hessler to the rear of the property where um, some of the occupants will enter the building, which also gives a connection to the parking. Move along, Carl. This is, I think everyone's familiar with the design of the micro units. Not much has changed here. Um, and we could, if requested, uh, provide additional information if anyone has questions about the, how a micro unit works. Carl, we can go through this quickly as everyone has seen these. This is the, the current elevation of the building, identifying the materials. We have um, modified the design, and I'll show that in subsequent slides. Um, based on commentary that we received from this body and from Euclid Corridor. Carl, if you can move along.
This was the design and rendering option B that was proposed. We received commentary about how to address the street. So as you can see, um, previously we did not have, we had one large um, lower level um, porch, and now we have the four individual entrances to each unit on the ground floor with our own steps walking up to them, which is similar to how the rest of the street is handled. We did get commentary about the scale of the uh, glazing and the window system. So as we move along, you'll see that we address that. So again, this is option B that was set up. This was a, a rendering study that we prepared for um, in response to a comment from Euclid Corridor about studying a trellis on top of the building, which was uh, not, not did not garner a favorable um, reaction. So it's not part of the project right now. So this is um, our final presentation that we made, rendering option E. Um, as you can see, the uh, windows that have into the units have been changed into standard um, size doors and casement windows adjacent to them um, to bring down the scale of the, the windows so that they're more appropriate to the scale of the building, which was a, a commentary uh, that we received from multiple bodies. This is an elevation of the building. Um, obviously, the building across the street um, is shown, and then above is shown this building in context with the 1975 building to the right and the existing duplex to the left. This shows the, the heights of the buildings, the eave, and the relationship of the building as you see a cross section through Hessler. This is the building shown in context uh, as a Photoshop overlay of, of the street. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Carl, this is from the transverse view, looking back towards Ford as the building is introduced onto the site. Carl, if you can go back up a couple of slides and pause one more up. I did want to highlight there was some uh, issues related to um, not having windows on this elevation. I mean, we actually do have windows on this elevation. It's in the, the park that's pocketed back three feet. Um, the way the site is configured and the arrangement of the property line um, as uh, was presented, a table, um, just to get technical for a second, table 705 code was presented um, by others. And in that chart, you can clearly see that any building within zero to three feet of property line is not permitted to have openings, no matter how they're protected. Um, Rick, I don't know if you want to speak to um, a discussion of moving forward with um, adjudication to see if we could potentially get windows, but I know that you stated that you made a commitment to add the windows on this elevation. If we could work out the code issues related to it with an offset by increasing life safety control by additional sprinkler heads. Or I just want to state that for the record that you made the commitment that we would uh, work with Mr. Vano's office to uh, see if we could introduce those windows, but we would need to uh, receive a variance from the code. But in general, that concludes my presentation and uh, I turn it back to the chair. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have feedback from the local committee? Did this go back to them or just stay within landmarks? That's a question for Don. Uh, Madam Chair, this uh, this went to the uh, Euclid Corridor Design Review Committee on April 15th. I uh, just want to remind the commission that, uh, I'm sorry, let me start over. This has been to the Euclid Corridor Committee twice, uh, once for conceptual review and once for final review. On uh, May, on April 15th, it was Conceptual approval was approved with conditions. The vote was eight to two. On May 6th, subsequent, subsequent to our last meeting, 
it went back to the committee for final approval. Uh, there was a motion to approve the project with conditions, including providing a permanent easement for parking instead of a lease, adding windows to the west facade, placing AC units in the roof gable, provide a landscape plan, and to provide a lighting plan. That motion to approve failed by a vote of two to four. So there, there is no approval from the uh, design review committee. Excellent, thank you. Do we have the councilman with us today? I don't know if he was able to join. I don't see him in the list. Hello, Ms. Trot, how are you? Oh, there you go. Nice to see you. Nice Thanks. To see Welcome, you. Councilman. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the committee. Um, I've registered my support for this project. I still support the project. Um, uh, I've met several times with the residents. Um, I know that a lot of the residents uh, do not like the project. Um, the agreement that I have had with the re uh, residents is that I will take me personally, I would take the politics out of it and allow the committee to um, review it on its appropriateness. Um, that it will be now whether it's appropriate or not and whether the experts will um, determine what happens with the landmark um, status for this. I am very, very, I do want to understand, make sure everybody understands this, very, very in tune with the community's concerns on this. Um, I will say that the bigger concern that I gather from the community is if this becomes um, to be mission creep to um, destroy the fabric and, and of, of Hessler, which a lot of them hold dear. They don't want this to be the first of many more new developments. So what I'm going to really ask this committee, even though I support this uh, project, that we take a very stern look at this district to make sure that somebody else doesn't allow property to deteriorate so that we have demolition um, so that we have other development that come to this because i have given my commitment to the residents that i would staunchly support any further um you know deterioration or um or taking away from the status of the of this street um this has been a very very hot topic um I, I i i know that all of you know that um i um unfortunately i'm on a, i'm on the other opposite side of many of the uh, residents in supporting this but i do understand their concern about how this affects um further development and further demolition but in good conscience i cannot uh, retrieve my support for this project because the developer has done everything that I've asked them to do to meet with the community several times to meet to make adjustments to this plan. Originally, I thought that the scope and size was too small. They shrunk it. They've done other things that have been asked to do. They've gotten rid of a lot of past asphalt um, and other things in the back park a lot. Um, so there's been a lot of things that I just know that they've spent time, money, and effort and really worked hard to try, to try to accommodate uh, what the community, uh, what we originally thought the community wanted. Um, essentially, we found that the community's concern is more so around um, whether or not this is a backyard and whether or not this can um, create further encroachment on this district. So um, I've really become fond of the Hessler residents because they're very passionate about this. They have a lot of supporters throughout the area. Um, but uh, once I give my commitment and once a developer does the things that I've asked them to do to accommodate this, um, my integrity makes me continue to support this project. So thank you, Ms. Trot. And once again, I hope that the experts look at this as appropriate. Is if it is, if it is not appropriate, then I accept whatever the uh the um opinion of this committee is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Griffin. Do we have others uh related to the city or the local um community development corporation? UCI? Well, Chairwoman Trout, thank you, and good morning, members of the commission and uh, staff of Landmarks and 
neighbors. Um, Councilman, congratulations again yesterday on the Neighborhood Choice Grant in the Buckeye Wood Hill neighborhood. It was great news for all of Cleveland and uh, connecting neighborhoods. I wanted to say since we last met, um, University Circle also received a national distinction and that is um, Best Arts District in America, which we were very proud of and everybody you know, that's associated with University Circle helps make that happen. It happened, I think, very much about the community around uh, the Arts District, about the vitality of the neighborhood, about the diversity of the neighborhood. And obviously, this past year has been a year of reflection and reckoning as it relates to truly what diversity, equity, and inclusion is all about and accessibility. That relates to this project. Um, that relates to the renovation of the two homes and the addition of the new structure on Hessler. This is about access. This is about diversity. This is about inclusion. This is a global neighborhood. And that again has to do with why we are best in class as an arts district. We pride our diversity. We pride our diversity. It comes from all over this world. We have people coming to study, to research, to help others heal. We have people coming who need housing product like you see on page 29 of this slide. We have people who needlessly don't, they don't need to go out and furnish everything anew. And this product actually provides what is a gap in product in this neighborhood. And that is something that is ready for someone to move in and such that year after year they don't have to curb furniture when they depart. These are residents too. Our view of residents from UCI's perspective needs to continue to be broad. Cannot be, as one person said to me, a rather offensive comment, the real residents. Everybody we consider to be a resident, and that's the big idea with inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, where housing is a contributor, and this project is a contributor to exactly that concept. So we welcome all comers. We are proud of the product before us. We are proud of what the development team and their architects have proposed. We are cognizant of divergent points of view and we respect all points of view. Chairwoman, I was asked to reflect on the process. Um, I was asked by uh, commission staff and I do wanna thank uh, Secretary uh, Don, specifically um, Don Pettit, Secretary Pettit for his perspective on this that he offered in the last meeting, we concur. Looking at the whole, we are getting two very important renovations that if you reflect back on slides earlier from Daniel's presentation, need renovation. Looking at the whole, we're getting new product. Looking at the whole that's infilling on a site. Looking at the whole, thanks to councilman's work, we're potentially getting a new start on a street that needs a lot of work. So reflecting on our engagement, this developer owns the property and the CDC's role uh, was to engage. So I was asked to talk about those meetings that occurred. In uh, order of the calendar, on February 10th, UCI held a public meeting for the Fort Hessler project over Zoom. On February 23rd, University Circles Architectural Review Board reviewed and endorsed this project. On March 11th, there was a Hessler resident Zoom meeting attended by UCI. On March 15th, Hessler residents Zoom meeting again with the development team. And again, on March 18th, there was a Hessler resident on-site meeting with the development team. We've gone through various iterations with the ERDC, and we do uh, always appreciate perspective. I was a part of the team that helped organize that Euclid Design Review Committee when I came from City Hall and came to University Circle. It is interesting to see a 180 degree flip on something that uh, was voted on and then voted on again. I'm not sure what entered the picture there and I'll withhold, withhold my comment on it. But I will say additionally, from UCI's perspective, after hosting and being a part of community meetings, we were glad to be both a host and an attendee. We came up with um, a view and, and looking at the iterative design changes, where as the councilman just said, the developer has listened. It was originally 24 units, now 12. It was originally a flat roof, now pitched. There was a price reduction offered through our organization post the sale, such that it could accommodate resident input that you see before you on this slide today. Those are dollars that go away from other programs like our youth education programs. So it does hurt. 
but we made that sacrifice to accommodate resident input that led to the product you see before you here. I wanna reflect back on the first meetings and then I'll end my comments. And that is what were our original design principles and planning framework? First, for the 1975 and 1981 Ford uh, buildings, the existing buildings, it was to preserve existing historic fabric along Ford Road, check, accomplished. To maintain the wood finish at 1975 Ford, check. Select exterior color palette to fitting the structure in the historic district at 1975 Ford, check. Maintain brick material at 1981 and with appropriate tuck pointing and maintenance of masonry, check. Accentuate natural light opportunities where appropriate. I'll stop with the checks, but the point is, is all of these are being met. Enhancing connection to Ford Road via inviting porches. Install landscape and planning is appropriate for four season Cleveland climate. Again, as Daniel's last slide showed, the planning framework and guidelines for the Hessler Street property, if you would go to page six, if I can uh, ask you, um, Daniel, to flip back to page six. This, I believe, is the object of contention. First of all, some have said this is not a vacant lot. You see, I did view this as a vacant lot. It is, it is how you see. It is what we see a property that could be activated to contribute. If you go to page eight, the property from the left, the second property in, if you look at all those rooftops and roof lines, I don't know what you see, but what I see is a vacant property, a property that could be an address on Hessler. We talked about this in the last meeting as a missing piece as a gap. So the second design guideline and plan framework for us was to infill, yes, what we're calling a vacant property. It was also to align the building setback to neighboring Hessler properties, again, accomplished as you look at the lot line just to the east and the complementary uh, setback to the west, the property that is sitting vacant. With to maintain verticality within two floors of any neighboring property, that's been done. Incorporate design cues of neighboring properties such as balconies, it's been done. Achieve eyes on the street effect through the outdoor porches and larger front windows, done. Maximize pedestrian access to building with ADA accommodation, done. Minimize curb cuts on the street. Minimize visible on-site vehicular parking and garage doors. The garage, it has emotional value, we get that. I've stood in that garage with Eric and reflected on past Hessler Street Fairs and I hope, heart of hopes that we have a Hessler Street Fair again. Spoke with someone the other night about exactly that. We're committed to that. When it ended in 2019, we were sad. We worked with the city and council and others um, to find ways to work through aggressive cost of security safety that makes street fairs somewhat cost prohibitive these days. I think we're there. We wanna see the fair come back, but the fair does not hinge on this open vacant lot. And the garage has emotional value. It's been offered by the developer to the community. I don't know if anybody's taken them up on it, we understand site connection and the connection to history. But that view of the garage as showed earlier by Daniel and our staff review, it is not an architectural contributor to this neighborhood. There are ways Landmarks Commission can respect the history. And I'm sure Don and Carl and others will do that. With photography, archive, we would too participate in that at UCI, but it should not preclude this whole idea of accessibility of housing for more for people who have needs to live in this neighborhood and walk in this neighborhood and be a part of this neighborhood as a resident fully a part of the neighborhood. So minimizing visible on-street vehicular parking and garage doors, yes, it's, it's, it's a fact. The garage goes with the site development. Install landscape planning is appropriate for four season Cleveland climate. Those were the design principles, the planning framework that were first called upon by UCI as we entered these meetings and we believe the developer has fully achieved those goals. So our statement of support is that UCI did select and support the development of the Bruce Development Partners and Merck Marin to create a future development that preserves, restores, respects existing fabric and Hessler Street District. Again, as one resident said, isn't a landmarks district meant so that there won't be development in the district? No, it's that that's complementary as Secretary of Interior Standards offer, as you know, members, that fills in a gap on Hessler Road with quality new construction that adds a unique housing product to the market. And finally, enhances neighborhood vitality by adding additional residential density in the district that supports neighboring restaurants, small businesses, 
walkability, public transit ridership, increases neighborhood safety and vitality with more eyes on the street. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to offer this testimony of support. Thank you to the councilman for his support. And thank you for the developers for listening to the community as a design iteration has scaled, we think to what's appropriate for the street. And I wanna finally thank residents, friends. You are friends, neighbors, been an emotional journey. And we understand it's emotional for you and it's emotional for our organization. We look forward to a day when we can have a festival back on the street. We we'll support you in that effort. We think that this is a contributor that adds value to the street and we're very proud also of the renovations that are gonna occur on Ford. Found a way to do it. We need to continue to work on that on the street and make this again, the best historic district we can have in this city and th this project contributes to that. Thank you and we endorse the project. Thank you. Um, we will move on to, uh, do we have other local planners or uh, that are here to speak on behalf of the project? I see a few in, are in attendance. Okay, then we will move on to the public and neighborhood uh, feedback. Um, before we start this, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, we had extensive discussion by the public and neighborhood at our last meeting to the order of over two hours to two and a half hours, um, just dedicated primarily to the neighborhood. We'd ask everyone to be respectful of the time and not rehash things that have been either discussed or emailed on uh, or you know, brought to uh, left in voicemails to people within the uh, commission. Um, we agreed to uh, open up the floor to the three representatives from the neighborhood. Um, so we will allow those three to speak. We will not be reviewing on other uh, presentations because they were distributed um, via email. You are able to give a summary of that though. We would welcome that. Um, and we'd also remind everyone to stay focused, please, on the project at hand. Um, we are not reviewing the entire district and the developer uh, at hand cannot make effects related to uh, things like street condition and so forth. So we'd ask you to stay focused on the project at hand. But before we begin this, I do wanna say from the commission standpoint is that this experience has really um, showed us the passion of this neighborhood and really refocused uh, us on the need to provide an opportunity for the neighborhood to have a voice related to things uh, related to new projects or conditions within the neighborhood. I think the commission is committed to beginning the process of determining what's the best avenue for that so that things like street conditions or new construction, um, the neighborhoods involved earlier in those discussions. We don't know if that's a, um, providing a local committee or um, determining a delegate for the neighborhood or uh, combining other you know, uh, commission, uh, committees around the area. So I think the commission, we're not willing to, or able to commit to something today, but we are able to commit to starting the process to explore and determine what's the best avenue for this neighborhood. So with that being said, uh, we will open the floor to the three uh, delegates that have been determined from the neighborhood, um, which is, uh, and I'm looking at your names online, so Mark F. and Jessica Wobeg. We'd ask you to limit your comments to two minutes to um, allow you know, others to speak and the commission to then be able to review this project. Ms. Wobeg or Mark F., uh, I don't know which one of you would like to go um, first. Ms. Wobeg will go first. Okay, Ms. welcome Ms. Wobeg. Please open up your mic and tell us uh, your feedback. I'm Jessica Wobig, an architectural historian with 11 years experience. I work for a for-profit company that is an engineering and construction firm. So my day job, I knock things down. Um, and part of that process is reviewing adverse effects to historic properties, which makes me an expert testimony today. And on behalf of the Hessler community, I'm representing um, a lot of legwork and effort carried out by the community members in consultation with each other, the councilmen, um, to try and seek some kind of resolve to present to you today what this proposal will do to the district as a whole, because site appropriateness is part of the consideration of a district. Under the landmarks own ordinance, um, the environmental changes um, that must be reviewed are any adverse effect 
to significant historical or aesthetic features. This includes um, size and scale of new construction, the removal of demolition, um, as well as the DC Circuit Court issued in, an opinion in March 2019 that a direct effect can also be that of a visual change. And that is exactly what we're talking about today when we talk about the district as a whole and how this proposal will negatively impact it. As you know, this is the first landmark district in Cleveland. The residents of Hessler were thoughtful and in the presentation I emailed to the uh, commissioners last night, I provided an overview of the history of the Landmarks Commission, which included support by residents in Hessler to get the Landmarks Commission established to form the Landmarks Ordinance. And they did that specifically for this type of a moment where the Landmarks Commission was charged with protecting this middle-class neighborhood from erosion of institutional encroachment. Under Landmarks Ordinance, spaces and site and environment and change in use are all part of the environmental review considerations under the Certificate of Appropriateness. That means the argument of, is it a vacant lot or not, is changed to, is this rear yard of this historic home minimally impacted by this new proposed development. I ask you, is this a minimal change? I also ask, will this new addition, is it compatible in massing size and scale, which Mark will further elaborate. And most importantly, I would like to appreciate your time for moving forward with this. And I hope that this is a learning moment for not only the city of Cleveland, for the council, for UCI, for developers, for the Cleveland Landmarks, that Cleveland cares about preservation and that there is a pro-preservation argument occurring throughout the city that is valuable to not only the vibrancy of this place, but the success of its residents and its future. With that, I hand it off to Mark. Hi, my name is Mark Prima. I'm an architect. I'm also a building owner, I own the building at the far uh, northeast of the site that you're seeing here. And I can use this slide to speak about this. I assume you've seen our presentation, so I'll, I'll try to be brief about it. Um, on the east side, which is to the right, you have a number of apartment buildings that are three to, to four stories high. They're brick. And they start to transition down to the west, the, those buildings in, in the middle are like two to three stories high. Then you get to those buildings that are blue in this picture, and they're basically frame buildings uh, with that are two stories high with an attic, sometimes it's livable. And they're single family, uh, two family or three family homes. And you can see they have a kind of rhythm and they go uh, the house, then there's a, there's a uh, driveway, then a house, then a driveway, in a house, and then um, there is a relief in this in the rhythm, and you have uh, this backyard. Now, um, uh, you, you, if you were to go down the street, and you've seen the picture, so we won't have to review it. But there is um, all these buildings have entrances on Hessler, and so uh, you have the entrances on Hessler. You have windows all around the buildings. The buildings, each of them is fighting for light to be able to get into their suites. So naturally, you have windows all around, um, and and then um, you, you know you finally get to this. The building is over on Ford, and again, th th that's a two-story building. Uh, I'm sorry, a two-story building with an attic at the corner, and then you have a two-story uh, apartment building just to the south of it. Um, so again, I want to emphasize there that there was a rhythm there. There is a significant amount of windows. There's eyes on the street. There's the doors. And uh, I also want to say that there's a similar massing. Once you get to those those blue houses, it's all kind of the same massing. Now, if you go to slide, can I take you to slide uh, 29? I think it is. I'm sorry, 24. So this is the um, building that's proposed by the developer, and you're seeing um, a building that is approximately two times the width 
of a normal building within that rhythm. You're also seeing a building that is one story higher. In fact, it's even a little higher than the original proposal that, you know, one of the original iterations. The issue with that is that it becomes out of scale. If you were to be down the street, uh, you'd have a hard time seeing back up the street and vice versa. If you're on the north side of the street sitting on one of the porches of the houses, those two two story houses with an attic, the light will be blocked to your your house now. Um, so we're saying that the building is out of scale and um, there's it's, it happens because of, of, of the planning of the building. So this is kind of a self-inflicted problem by the by the owners. They decided they wanted to have these units that are somewhere between 460 and 500 square feet. Um, and they're just long units with one window at the end. And I, we think that the unit is inappropriate because what it does is causes this problem. Um, between the buildings, you can see in this picture, there's a space. It's probably about 30 feet. Uh, the builders decided either they put the property line there or, they, or there was a property line. That problem with that property line is a result of their planning. The fact that there's no windows there is a result of the type of unit they're using, or it's just, just because they don't want to design a building with windows on that side. Thing is that you see that you see that elevation if you're coming into Hessler. It's it's a very prevalent um, elevation and uh, it's important. And that same kind of treatment happens all around the building. It happens also on the on the south side of the building where there's an elevator and there's stairs. It happens on the east side of the building. There may be uh, some incidental windows, but there's no way that one could say I think architecturally there's enough windows on those sides of the building. Um, as far as the the doors and the and the windows and, and the entrance doors, I think that it's important to understand the relationship of of these suites to the street versus the relationship of the the current suites to the street. Basically, if you're in the suite, this long narrow suite, you're not going to be able to see uh, out into the street. You're, the balconies will make it so that you can't even see to the street. You're, these are deep units and you're not going to be able to see it. So the theory of eyes on the street is kind of, it just kind of goes away. There's one big eye on the street. Um, so again, the building is higher it's, and it's wider than the buildings adjacent to it. The, the, the elements of the building are not consistent with the elements of, of, of the other buildings around it. The elements of the other buildings around it, as you remember from looking at previous slides, are single and double hung windows. There's entrance doors on the front. It's not respective here. These railings and the lights, they're not respective or similar to the other elements and other windows and lights on the street. Um, um, and I think you have to ask yourself, does the building feel like it's a building on Hessler? It's by virtue of its size and the, these different elements, I think you could say that it doesn't. And um, we think the building in general is out of scale. Now, I want to say um, there's, there's ways to probably uh, make this building work or a building work here, but this is not that building. And some of those, those, those ways of making it work have been suggested to the to the developer and um, in, including at the last meeting with the with the Euclid corridor design review. Now, the, the developer and Mr. Ronane have suggested that there's been a lot of communication between the the uh, developer and the residents of the street and and that there's been responsiveness and that I think is far from the truth. I have to say uh, this this thing that you're looking at is exactly the same presentation that, that the design review saw uh, back in uh, the beginning of May. And um, I think it could be said that there is absolutely no adjustments that have been made at that design review. And, and just to remind you, 
your experts, your design experts at that design review meeting voted this down. So I think it can be said that there's not actually much of a um, adjustment going on here. One Mr. other thing Mr. I just want to add. Could you wrap up your comments? Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to. One other thing I want to say, uh, there's a, there's a, a discussion by Mr. Renane about, about, I think, basically uh, furnishing, uh, having furnished apartment units. And I can tell you as an apartment owner on the street, uh, we, we provide apartment units that are furnished. Um, we, we charge $200 in addition to what we, we would normally charge for a furnished apartment unit, which would bring our apartment units up to about $1,300. So, I, you know, it, 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 it kind of, it makes me feel a little bit funny about being accused of not wanting to be diverse. I mean, the market already is diverse on Hessler, just to tell you. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for your feedback. Um, we do appreciate uh, everyone's perspective at these meetings. We'll now move on to the commission. We'll open up the floor to the commission for comments and to ask questions. Ms. Bailey, you have your hand raised. Mr. Fremont, if you don't mind uh, lowering your hand, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bailey, you are first. Ms. Bailey, you are muted if you're trying to talk. I can't see you right now. Okay, we'll move on to the next while we're waiting for Ms. Bailey. Uh, can you, can you hear me Bailey? now? Yes. Okay. Um, I was trying to use my um, cell phone too. Um, I thought there was an adjustment uh, made on, especially the material wise from the last design that we saw um, from the last meeting, um, especially with the two sections on the side and that's in the center, um, especially in the middle. Um, that the materials were adjusted where the size were um, was kind of less in where the um, center was kind of more of a forefront and the side was less and so the comment was just made as if the design wasn't changed at all. So my thought was that I like with the design shown from the last, whereas it looks as if it was three sections were made, whereas the center um, stands out and the two sides were made and materials were adjusted, whereas um, especially the center part, because that was my main concern from the last meeting and materials were adjusted, whereas it can kind of lessen that massive look in the center. So my thought was that, um, yeah, um, that by doing that, kind of make it into three sections, make versus from the last design, make it more uniform, kind of breaking it up into pieces, make it more or less massive looking in the front. So I kind of like that design compared to the last one. So to me, it was a more of an upgrade from the last design. So my I commended the uh, designer for doing that. So um, that's my thoughts. And um, by them lessening the center part up in the center, it made it less um, massive looking and using the material to help with that. So it's an upgrade improvement from the last design. So I like the improvement that they did from the last, um, what I saw. Great, thank you, Ms. Bailey. That's my comment. Great. Thank you, Ms. Yes. Bailey. Other questions or comments from the commission? Ms. Anderson. Can you? 
Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going. I'm going to read directly. From the um, secretary of interiors uh, standards regarding. Um, historic properties. Uh, uh, features of the new construction on the site of the historic building must be compatible with those of the historic building and when visible in close prox proximity. Um, well, instead of just reading this, let me just say. I, I the height and the size of the building is larger than the. Um, existing building on the site and I I think the uh, size must be um, not overwhelming the uh, existing uh, historic uh, building. Uh, the, the site isn't all that big. It's only uh, 74 by <laughs> one. So, uh, yeah, I, I think this new construction is, is still too large and I, I do believe that and I might be wrong, but I think that the community would probably support new construction there if it was something more to scale with the, as you can see the in one of the slides, um, the areas uh, on the aerial uh, view that are shown in blue are the residential properties. And I think it was something more consistent with those residences uh, that are to the east, as well as the one um, adjacent to the uh, property. I think there, there would be more support from the neighborhood, and I think it would be more appropriate for the site. So that's what I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Collier, I believe you're next. Yes, uh, I want to talk about a couple of different factors that have been uh, brought up during the uh, presentation. Um, one, and I'm glad you're on this slide because it was referenced uh, with respect to the cadence uh, of the buildings uh, along the street. And, you know, one of the things that I see, and I look at this image is uh, not necessarily uh, a rhythm, you know, but a variation and pattern and scale. And when you look at the footprint or the size of this building, uh, it does not appear to be disrupted uh, to that. Uh, context, you have to look at this site and this proposal in the context of the, ent of the entire district, not just uh, with the focus on the adjacent properties. The other thing I want to uh, just touch on a bit is the materials uh, with respect to the brick that's being used, uh, the window treatments, particularly on the front uh, facade, um, and that they seem to be very much uh, compatible with the surrounding materials in the neighborhood uh, on existing buildings. Uh, of course, the building is not all brick. Um, there is a variation of materials. And I wanted to ask the uh, developer if he can kind of articulate that relationship um, with respect to the brick, um, the, the style that relates to uh, that of the district. And how he picked up on whatever themes that the district in, you know, provided uh, to him as they thought about this building, uh, but I'll do that after I make my comment. I'll have you do that after I make my other comments. The other uh, piece that I do want to mention from a, a citywide perspective, and one of our key goals, you know, is to provide new and renovated housing that meets the needs and preferences of all Clevelanders of all incomes, ages, and lifestyles. So when we see new investment introduced, we think about this idea around uh, diversity of product, uh, diversity of style. Obviously, when you are in a historic district, that narrative changes a bit and there's uh, uh, a less uh, ambiguous sort of approach to that. And this is in part why when we talk about the scale and materials and things of that nature, why they matter. And when we looked at this, uh, you know, from a uh, staff perspective, we really took all of that into consideration, you know, understanding the history, you know, of the district, understanding 
um, the, uh, the history of Hessler, uh, understanding uh, the comments that the community uh, made. And when you look at it from a process standpoint, the iterative exchange uh, that has occurred uh, has been fairly robust. And not to mention the adjustments that have been made, you know, by the developer uh, doesn't indicate, you know, to us at all that there was a ignoring of community uh, engagement and input. And then lastly, I just want to say, uh, you know, when you have a district uh, that's this distinctive because it's a very unique uh, a place. And when you look at the history of urban communities, you know, density was a big part of that, that urbanism. And part of the work that we're doing right now is, you know, really bringing our city back to its urbanity. Um, and it's an urbanity that we lost, uh, quite frankly, you know, due to sprawl and, and, and other factors. So, when you start to consider, you know, all of those things, you know, and I look at this development, it becomes uh, becomes much more palatable and, and, and favorable uh, with respect to how it fits. Um, arguably, there, there's always some nuances. Uh, I think the gentleman brought up the uh, concern around the window treatments around the rest of the building, you know, uh, indicating that the front facade had, you know, uh, was very heavy with respect to windows, which that's a good thing. Um, but again, with the, uh, the rest of the uh, actual building, you know, you could arguably say that, a, a, a additional windows could go in, but I think overall, you know, this is a very, uh, interesting and unique proposal that actually, uh, is additive, um, to the district and really fills in a gap. You know, I think that, you know, having that investment and having the, uh, new residents, uh, part of the Hessler family, I think is very important. Uh, so those are my comments. And I, I think this is a, a pretty good proposal uh, for this uh, particular uh, street based on what I've seen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Mr. Bonazzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm gonna start off my comments with, I'm. this is my first time seeing the project. So I quickly understand that I am jumping into kind of a contentious discussion with regards to this project. And I, and I first want to give credit to the developer and the community, which is that um, in, in, from my personal standpoint, I do agree that there is a cadence and a rhythm to the urbanity that is missing. And especially when you look at this in plan and you look at the context of the way that you turn the corner from Hessler onto the main road, is that there is a hole that is missing. And, and um, so that would be my first comment, which is that I agree that the project is appropriate in that there's something is missing. Something is missing from completing the cadence of this dense urbanity that is kind of, as Director Collier was kind of commenting on, is something that we want to bring back into the city of Cleveland. Um, but as for the appropriateness, I want to speak you know, purely architecturally, which is that, in my opinion, there are a few key things that are out of scale and, and out of proportion in the way that the building is articulated. And I think that there's solutions, though, that could allow for the project to move forward. Um, and one of the um, my suggestions and, and one of my conditions that I, I keep having a problem with is when you read it as a volume, it, it is a volume with porches attached to the front versus I've been constantly scrolling through the images um, down Hessler, which is rather all the other porches and the other um, treatments of the front facade treat it as porches that are carved away from a volume rather than porches that are tacked onto a volume. And I think it's that subtle relationship between the way that the front of the building is in context, in relationship to the back of it, to its actual substance, um, that's causing a lot of these um, conditional readings of the building as being so massive and being so heavy. Um, the other key issue, which, which I agree that fellow member uh, Ms. Anderson brought up, which is that the height of the building in relationship to the other buildings is, um, 
problematic. I don't think it's in the overall height of the building. I think it's in the usage of that kind of mansard roof that comes up to a pyramid type roof line that's singular at the top, rather than a type of varied roof line that you see down through the street. Um, so I think it's those two, these two issues, one of roof line and one of volume um, that are causing all these types of uh, dissatisfaction with the building as an architecture. But I want to, I do completely agree and I completely justify the feelings of the developer, the feelings of um, what we've heard from now, which, and all the comments made prior, which is that, you know, we want to see things grow. This is a site that, you know, in my opinion, is asking for a completion, right? It's like the missing puzzle piece, right? Um, someone just didn't have the funds. 20 years ago to, or 100 years ago to finish off the street. Um, but this just isn't the right answer yet, in my opinion. And I, I think it needs, you know, not, not just like these subtle tweaks of like changing the windows, changing this. I, I think, you know, the community, if they could see, or if they felt included in kind of a solution that was a complete, just, you know, what, what's something if we tried again? Um, I don't want to misspeak because I'm obviously coming into this conversation at a later date, but from my uh, opinion and my um, analysis of the situation, I, I would, uh, those are my conditional thoughts on what's happening. Um, so that's where I'd like to leave it at. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bonazzi. Mr. Strickland, you are next with feedback. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a question that I have, the, the height looking at this elevation is at uh, 46 and a half feet. And I I was not part of the last meeting. I don't know if it was discussed. It says it was 47, seven and a half inches. Um, does this project require a height variance or is this within the uh, zoning, current zoning height? This is yeah, this is this is Daniel Cirk. The height limitation for the zoning distance is 120 feet. Oh, okay. So this is a, a high rise zoned neighborhood. Uh, so then, well, I think Director Collier, uh, in his comments, expressed many of uh, comments that I would have relative to this project. Uh, in my viewing of the uh, context photos i think the uh the height and the massing although it's different than the uh, adjacent structures is consistent with the overall rhythm on the street and uh so i think that the developer has go gone above and beyond in terms of reacting to past comments and inputs and tried to adjust the project to a, a scale that would be uh, complementary on the street. And so I would express my uh, favor in approving this project. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Ms. Anderson, your hand was up. Is that a remaining from earlier or did you have additional comments? No, I do have additional comments, Madam Chair. And I want to um, welcome Commissioner Bonazzi uh, to the Landmarks Commission. Uh, I really appreciate his thoughtful comments and I look forward to working with him uh, on these presentations. Um, I just want to mention that uh, historically that, I guess what we're calling a vacant lot, but that, that open space was intentional uh, that the house, I think it's at um, 1981 Ford, the one on the corner, was built as a, a mansion. It was a, you know, it was a, a single family residence. Uh, the, the open space was the backyard and towards the rear of the parcel uh, is, is now the garage. Um, there is no other open space on Hessler, everything else is is completely built. Um, so I don't see 
the potential for uh, you know deterioration and vacant uh, vacant lots there. Uh, for one thing, I don't think we would allow demolition on that street. Um, but that that is the only open space there. Uh, again, it was intentional. Um, I'm not saying that it would be in a, totally inappropriate to uh, build on that spot. I just still see the size and scale overwhelming the uh, adjacent properties, including probably the the property that should take precedence, the property that should be the focus of this uh, this uh, particular little spot, it would be the, the house on the corner. Um, and I think this uh, is going to somewhat overwhelm that. So I, I just wanted to make that clarification. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Our Ms. Anderson. Uh, Ms. Bailey, I believe you're next, and then Mr. Trosik. Um, thank you. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Um, Strickland, for asking the height there and um, the developer answered a question. There's a photograph. Um, could you um, run through real quick? Um, and I noticed something. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Stop. Go back. One more photograph. Stay right there. Do you see some tall structures right behind it? And you said it was high rise structure. So there's some answers to two high rise structures. So the building is at 46, and then you have two high rise structures right behind it. Um, I also noticed during the presentation, and I forgot to mention in my notes, I wrote it down in my notes. Um, one of the photographs to show a section um, comparison to your building height and across the street, there's an existing structure that's a little taller than the new structure that you put in across the street. The section. So this is existing. So this is going to be a little shorter than existing. I'm assuming they're across the street from each other. And then also I noticed um, in one of the photograph presentation, material wise, at least the developer was trying to attempt to also duplicate, but not, um, not, my, not trying to 100% duplicate it. The, um, if you can go to one of the uh, um, street photograph showing the building to with the uh, the tall structure with the um, building. Um, if you keep going, you can see the material almost looking um, the porch. Um, keep going. Oh, I believe she's referencing the photographs towards the end of the presentation. The street view. Yeah, that is, you're looking down the street, you can see the material and then just, yeah, right there. So you can see that the developer trying to almost duplicate the Porsche in the new construction with the existing building porch um, with the existing condition in the new construction. So he's so they also trying to duplicate the architecture st structure in the new construction. So they're not trying to deliberate something new in the in the um, or Hessler. They trying to bring in the existing condition on the street into the new construction. So I'm trying to show that there's a high rise behind the new construction, but also they're trying to duplicate the material and also this new existing construction of a place 
right there that you see in this photograph on the left into the new construction porch drives. So they trying to bring everything on the street into this new construction. So they're not really deviating from the neighborhood on the street into the new construction. So that's my thought. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Mr. Tarasik. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I'd like to direct my my one question to one of the two representatives from the neighborhood. Uh, uh, and I apologize for, for seemingly to be very familiar, but the only names I took down were Mark and Jessica. Um, and this is a question to either one of you two. Uh, is it is it the position of the neighbors, the neighborhood, uh, that it is the the massing of this particular structure itself that is the issue, that it is not whether a structure or a, a, a building should be placed on this particular site, nor is there really an issue with the materials. But I think what I gathered from most of the comments that you, that, that both of you had had, uh, is that uh, it really comes down to a, a massing issue. Is that, am I correct in that? Um, well, the, you know, the group is has a lot of different opinions. Um, the, I think that uh, there is some feeling that if if the building was the right building, it would be okay with with the group. Um, and is it just about the massing? I think massing is a big deal. I think actually materials is a, is a big problem too. I mean, you're looking at siding uh, around the entire building with just a couple of windows. And there's a, a number of things in, in regard to scale and style of materials and style of windows and uh, the entrances not being on Hessler. Um, even the landscaping, it doesn't it doesn't appear to be similar to the landscaping on the street. So there's a, a number of things, but but massing is is yes, it's a big deal. Yes, well, I guess my more my more direct question, I think, is there there isn't an objection to a structure being placed on this particular site. Am I correct with that? I, I think that there is from a lot of people there is because of the understanding of, of this as being a lot that was part of the the house on Ford, but uh, re there's also other people who think that the building, if if done the right way, could be appropriate. So with it, if, even within even within the the neighborhood, there is a divergence of opinion as to whether anything itself should be there let alone whether this particular structure or a modification of this particular structure should be there. Is that fair? It's fair, but there is no divergence on the fact that the mass is too big. That's okay. It's way too big. Um, Carl, might, I, Car might I just ask, um, just in referencing this photo, the change of view, like you see the new construction, that's where my eye goes. And so I feel like, as Mark suggested, there's differences of opinions, but everyone's unanimous that this specific project is not as appropriate as proposed. Thank you. Uh, Carl, if you would, please, there is a slide, and I don't know which one it is, but there is one that shows a, a front view of this particular project uh, height-wise as it relates, that's it, yes, as it relates to the other ones. And that's the one I, I just wanted to see. I don't say I have a comment, but I guess I wanted to see that uh, from both an elevation standpoint and a massing standpoint uh, on there. Um, I, I, I do uh, agree with my, my colleague, Ms. Bailey, uh, that uh, uh, at least from my perspective, I don't necessarily see a, a, a difference as far as materials are concerned or anything different that this developer is trying to do uh, on this particular uh, uh, location, uh, I, I do see uh, a break uh, in what what uh, I would view as the 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 rhythm of the the street and having this particular uh, lot uh, or location being vacant, almost like a missing tooth uh, and, and, a, and a smile, if you would, to be metaphorical in, in, in that particular neighborhood. Um, and I think any other concerns uh, as far as additional development, 
I think uh, another one of commission members mentioned the fact that it would require demolition. Uh, and I think that the uh, uh, the focus there would be uh, to to ensure that we never got to a position where uh, there would be a piece of property there that would even come before this committee or commission that would require a required demolition. Um, but I think I would echo some of the comments uh, of uh, Ms. Bailey, uh, as well as uh, Director Collier and Mr. Strickland uh, with respect to this particular project. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Trasek. Uh, Mr. Collier, your hand is back up and then I'll make my comments too. Yes, um, just this is brief. Uh, if you can go to that previous slide that was shown before that, that shows the view down the street. Uh, I'm sorry, one more, yeah, that one. Uh, when you turn this corner and you look at this, um, absent of the new proposal, your eyes are drawn to the very hefty building to your left. When I look down the street, now my eyes are drawn in a more balanced way where I see these two structures. Uh, this one to the right that's the, uh, is prominent, no question. Uh, but it also kind of balances the street, given the fact that you had this historic uh, older structure to your left. You know, absent the investment that's being made, anyone's eyes are drawing, drawn to that uh, larger, you know, left side uh, of the screen where that very large building, you know, exists. And just going back to the earlier comment, you know, looking at it from a district level, you know, as a whole, you know, one would have to, you know, consider, you know, this building in the context uh, of the, the district. Uh, one other thing I, I kind of dare to bring up, but I want to uh, just touch on this real briefly, is this uh, thing, psychological concern, in a, you know, about encroachment, you know, uh, or the notion of encroaching or uh, taking over uh, the district. You know, Hessler is a very, you know, unique intimate, tight street with a lot of character. Um, as I looked at that aerial photo, this is one gap in that, one. We're not talking about a district that has multiple vacant parcels like we have to deal with the neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland. That's right. We're talking about one, one parcel. So when I look at that and I say, wow, you know, here's a, I think sensitive, you know, investment um, in this particular district that is additive uh, with bringing life. And, you know, when I used the term earlier about inviting people into the Hessler family, you know, I mean that, you know, because this street is familial. I think that is why the councilman, uh, UCI, and uh, everybody involved is listening, you know, and we care about what the community is saying. Uh, but when we talk about this from sort of a planning, design, appropriateness perspective, I think all of the things that have been stated here ex are extremely relevant. And, uh, you know, when you look at this investment, you know, it does appear to be, you know, appropriate and additive to this district. So those are just, you know, just some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Mr. Tarasik, you had your hand up again, and then I'll... I apologize, ma'am. I did, yeah. did not lower my hand from before. Okay, no problem. Um, well, looking like we've gotten through many of the commission's comments, I guess I will make mine now. Um, I guess I, I have some comments. I, I tried to raise my hand, but it doesn't seem to be working. Okay. Well, how about I make my my sure, comments sure. and then Giancarlo, you can you make yours. Of course. Um, so I, I would have to agree with the comments that have been made that you know in this neighborhood particularly. Um, that lot in both an aerial and a physical standpoint feels like a missing tooth to me personally. Um, although the property had the garage, looking at the adjacent properties, um, it is odd. You know, it's the only one who has that uh, configuration in this area and the depth of the backyard. Knowing what we're trying to do across the city and pulling parking off the street for the safety and the um, the community and trying to fill them in with uh, places that you know, are um, occupiable and safe. 
I guess I am aligned with that. I feel development is appropriate on this site. I think I made it the last time. The scale of this, though, is still um, it feels large. Uh, so a few questions for you on and apologize. I didn't bring them up before, but I think the conversation you know, really in, uh, brought the t them to light is you have an elevated 1st floor and which is making your building higher. Uh, have you explored your, it looks like your floor to floor is about 10 feet. Is that correct on each floor? Yes, Julie, that's correct. And is there a, f that roof area that's making it in, um, require it to be the height that it is? I can address that if you want, Dan. Um, you raised, you raised 2 points. 1 is yes, the floor is elevated. <clears throat> Because to keep the rhythm of the street and all the houses, if, even in this shot, if you notice a house to the left, everyone walks up a staircase to get into their unit. We could drop it down, as you say, to street level and reduce the height. The other thing, so that's that's that point. On the other point, the gable has no functional value. It is purely architectural and trying to fit into the street. I don't think we ever presented to this committee, but the four story project that we had, <clears throat> excuse me, which was twice the size, it was had 24 units and uh, that that project had a flat roof on it. Um, I think, oh, go ahead. What we, if, if we, you so chose, we could always eliminate the gables and put a flat roof on it. And we then would be lower than the houses on each side of it. Uh, it's more of an architectural and we felt, and you may feel otherwise, uh, that the gable adds more to the community. It's more expensive. So from a financial standpoint, It'd be easier just to put a flat roof on it and we'd be lower than the other buildings. Um, the other thing is from there's a lot of discussion about massing. The floor plate is only 2600 square feet. So it is not a big building. And it's horizontal this way, kind of like the way we did West 14th, because architecturally everyone really seems to like it. And Having this porch in the front with the four units, making it almost feel like a row house type effect. Um, architecturally seemed to work well and the brickwork in reference to Mr. Collier's question, the brickwork and the materials are very close and I could let the architect speak more about that. Um, very close to the rest of the street and the brick is full brick. It's not the fake brick or the half brick. So I'll stop there. No, I think that's great additions um, and helps you know, bring context to, to this. Um, I mean, the mat, the design is very horizontal. Did you ever explore anything that was more vertical to help it feel and look more like a row house versus one singular mass? I'm not sure, but I understand the question. Can Madam Chair, if I may. I, I, I didn't understand the question. Did you, Dan? Yes, I mean, we did, in, uh, Madam Chairman, we, we did in the earlier iterations come with a more clustered vertical design, um, but that seemed to um, not be in concert with the rest of the uh, structures on the street. I mean, if I could pepper in, I think Ms. Bailey really uh, hammered home a point of what we were challenged with architecturally. Carl, if you can go to the street view again, that shows what is called by the students in the neighborhood. My daughter lives there. Um, and uh, they call that the fortress, that building at the corner in Hessler. Um, that was the first thing that we keyed in on as a very challenging structure to try to coexist with on the street. Um, obviously it sets the tone historically for the neighborhood. And then as you pass down the street, other structures also have that same brute force um, that this building has. And so we attempted to 
cue in on some of the more delicate elements of, of the fortress. And Ms. Bailey pointed that out in this view. I hope she illustrates that the balconies, open air balconies, uh, being very similar to, to what we see on the street to work to try to blend um, all the fabric that we're, we're, we're working with. The, a lot of comments seem to be about the relationship of the massing of this building to the building directly adjacent to it. But I think as a composition and to, to anchor this street, um, I think this, this is the balance that we've tried to achieve in addition to listening to the, um, the residents. I mean, as Rick pointed out, and Mr. Ruin pointed out, this was a much more massive project at the beginning with 24 units and a flat roof and, and you know, a, a lot of uh, delicate structure to it to try to attempt to blend in. And in reaction to the neighbors, when we walk the street after our, our get together, um, I heard things like, we would like to see more brick. We'd like to see pitched roofs. And that's, that's what we responded to. So sometimes I, I'm not a big fan of design by committee, but I think this was a, a good result of design by committee and all of the reactions that we got from uh, the local design review and, and the group at UCI and the Euclid corridor. Um, and your committee, and as well as the residents, to try to come up with a building that balances all of those features. And I think this view is quintessential to, to the appropriateness in that it needs to focus on the entire um, uh, relationship of the structures to, to the street that we have. And the cadence that Mr. Collier uses is an excellent word because we're trying to start off, when you turn the corner and you head down the street, um, you have something that counterbalances the massiveness of the fortress. And then as you proceed down the street, you can go to the next slide, um, looking back the other direction, you can see that this building, as it relates to the fortress, um, and, and with the brick material turning the corner, kind of creates that envelope that then sets up a transition to the single family or the, or the, or the duplexes as you go down the street. And then you proceed down the street further and you get back to much larger masonry buildings. So sorry if that was a long answer, Madam Chairman, but uh, that was our approach architecturally. Um, and that's why we, we kept this, uh, this relationship um, of how the building has sort of a linear feel to respect what's happening with the uh, residential um, just before it. Excellent, no, I appreciate that feedback. Um, and then, Carl, could you go to the photograph of the picture of the building on the corner of Ford and Hessler? The one that is on the right side of this building. Thank you. Yeah, that would be like slide six, I think. Five, and there you go. And just for my, uh, actually, that was it. Uh, one more back. What is the width of this structure? I mean, this seems like a fairly a larger house in context to what is on Hessler. What's the width of this house compared to, to yours uh, proposed development? Uh, you know, my comments for accuracy. Let me pull that really quickly. That's okay. I mean, I, I guess what I'm going is, you know, I'm, I think you've tried to be sensitive to the uh, feedback that you've given and some of the context. And to me, I am trying to and see a relationship to this building to that your new proposal. I do think the scale is you know, still larger than um, I personally like. Yeah, you know, but I like the uh, proposal of in you know, really filling in that in vacant lot that is currently a parking lot so that the, it really fills in that gap in the neighborhood um, and just looking for ways to continue to uh, improve it and you know, fit into the context of the neighborhood. And that's why I was asking about the roof in this building because the configuration of it reminds me of this building and trying to you know, um, blend in you know, this structure to the remaining uh, structures on Hessler. Is why I was asking. That's 40, 40 feet wide, Madam Chair. And what's the width of your proposal? 60. Okay, so it is you know, much wider. 
the opposite the opposite side of 1971 for 1975 Ford is 51 feet along that elevation um, because the building has a, a unique shape with the porch off the rear. Got it. The like length said, of the building, yeah, the length of the building across the street, the fortress is 121 feet. Excellent. That's helpful too. Um, and, yeah, so as I, you can see by our yeah, and you can see by our site plan, our attempt was, and when we eased off. The side of the building to allow the driveway. Um, it worked out that that we anchor the corner so that view that you see looking back towards Ford, the corner of the uh, of the four story uh, masonry building um, does align with the corner of this proposed building. We sort of set up that anchoring to keep that cadence of open space to building envelope. Got it. So I, I think the the Feedback that I have, I like the gables of how it relates to, you know, the, um, and fits in better with the neighborhood, but I only question if that, you know, main, you know, gable, central gable and or the mansard are as appropriate, the central gable, because I think that's what truly continues to trip me up personally, is that, you know, it's, it, it does make the structure seem taller than you are intending it to be. And, and that's that delicate balance of trying to blend in with the neighborhood, but not you know, overpower the neighborhood. So I guess that's my feedback is that I, I do think the personally, the um, use and the new construction is appropriate here, but I'm still struggling a little bit with the height of the roof and how that is you know, fitting into the, the scale of this related to the adjacent buildings. Other feedback from the commission. We're going to maintain our, our feedback right now from the commission since we have um, pretty much closed the floor from the public. I think Mr. Kalikia had some comments oh. I wanted to make. Thank you, Carl. Mr. Kalikia. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions before I make my comments. Um, one is, um, was there ever a building on that lot? You don't know. No one actually knows. Mr. Kalikia, uh, the house that fronts on Ford Drive was the front yard, and the garage that's in the back was the garage for that house. Okay. Okay. So this is the only structures that have ever been on that property in its history. Okay. And then the other question I have, which is kind of a technical question, how will the parking be handled as far as new structure is concerned? The parking is uh, as allocated on the site plan. It's a one to one ratio for the building. Okay, so my comments are is that obviously we've made considerable progress since uh, we've been discussing this project. And I think there's a consensus that we're okay um, with a new building here. And it seems to be down to some issues regarding aesthetics and scale. And I guess the other question I have is, why can't we have a, an entrance to this building from Hassler? We do have four entrances on Hessler to the lower floor units. For the upper units, the entrance is on, in the rear. Okay. Yeah, I think I agree with some of the made by Shell and this track regarding the scale so that um, I just did some quick figuring here. The lot is about 10,000 square feet. So you're saying that each floor is approximately 2,400 square feet? And Dan, you can correct me, but I think it's 2,600. 2,600. Okay. Um, so I, I guess, you know, my issue is then um, I like the roof. And um, I'm not sure about lowering the building, what that would accomplish. Uh, I mean, making it smaller. I mean, we, we've discussed this project really at, at great length. And um, 
I think if we could satisfy some of these requests pertaining to the scale and maybe um, we might be closer to getting a, an approval here, I think. Um, that's all really I really have to say. I, I really cannot make any specific suggestions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kalikia. Mr. Collier, your hand is back up. Uh, yes, two things I just want to mention. You can't mess with that gable because if you touch the gable, you talk about the character of the building is lost if you mess with that gable. And you want to talk about the uh, throwing it off from the context of the street. If you make that into a flat roof or do anything with those gables, you lose that character. The other component was the discussion around the porches and lowering the uh, building. The concern around lowering those porches, it also detracts from supporting the context of the neighborhood because those porches are almost in line with the porches right next door. So the porch height gives you that feeling, I think, of continuity. And if you were to bring that porch down to ground level, those will feel more like condo units because you don't have that porch height and you don't have that uh, sort of uh, grand feeling, for lack of a better word, that a porch provides to a home as you approach the entry. So I just want to. And I make don't sure disagree. That, I was just asking if it's been yeah. explored and or shown um, because of some of those reasons that I think it is. You know, there's trying to. Uh, meet in the middle of fitting this building into the context uh, and it does change the character i would agree yeah that's all i want to just mention to the group thank you Madam Chair, are you ready to entertain a motion? <laughs> Sorry, I was talking with my mute on. <laughs> okay. um, is there additional questions or comments or on? Did anyone hear the comments I just made a few minutes ago? I didn't realize my mute was on. Um, before the motion. It's after the director. Uh, before the motion. Wait, I'm um, sorry, Mr. Do we have to make a motion on the um, demolition? Uh, yes, that would be the first thing that we would start with. We have four things that uh, need to be re um, discussed today and a um, motions put forward on. So I'm sorry, Mr. Strickland, you were saying something? Oh, you I had asked me if you're ready to entertain a motion, I would put forth the motion to approve the demolition of the two stall garage on Hessler. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Now second. Thank you, we have a motion and a second uh, by Ms. Bailey. Do we have any further discussion on the demolition of uh, the 11300 Hessler Road garage? Uh, we do have uh, Mr. Pettit with his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to point out that we have four elements to act on today. Uh, I would like to, first of all, echo your comments earlier in the meeting about our willingness and desire to re-engage with the neighborhood in the future, about process and, and, and the district moving forward. I'm not sure, you know, I've read the, the mitigation that was in the statement that they submitted to us yesterday. I don't think we can promise that we, we're committed to all of those things yet, including a design review committee, uh, design guidelines, a preservation plan for the street. But I would just ask the commission to consider uh, some kind of a, a, an agreement uh, moving forward, that we will engage the community in, in a process that uh, uh, addresses some of their concerns with this project. Uh, uh, that, that's all I wanted to add there. 
Okay, thank you. Do further discussion on the demolition from the commission. All right, Ms. Uh, Bailey and, and Ms. Anderson, are your hands up related to uh, feedback on demolition? I don't think my hand is up. Oh, I think that's John Carlo, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if there's no further discussion, Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Uh, yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonazzi. Yes. Sorry, my keyboard wasn't working. Thank you. Mr. Kalikia. Yes. Mr. Collier. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trot. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. We'll then move on to um, looking for a motion related to the 1981 Ford Drive renovation. Would someone like to put forward a motion on this portion of the project? Madam Chair, I can put forward a motion. Thank you. Go ahead. Motion uh, is your. Go ahead. I move that we approve the renovation of the Ford Road project as presented. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Second by Mr. Strickland. Further discussion? Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Kalikia. Yes. Director Collier. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trot. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. All right, and we'll move on to our second item on our agenda for the 1975 Ford Drive renovation. Would someone like to put forward a motion? Madam Chair, this is Bob Strickland. I would move to approve the renovation of 1975 Ford Drive residence. As presented? As presented. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Madam Chair, I'll second that. Second by Mr. Bonesi. Uh, further discussion? Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Kalikia. Yes. Director Collier. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move to our first uh, item on our agenda related to the 11300 Hessel Road new construction. Would someone like to put forward a motion? I move for approval for um I move approval as presented. Okay. Um there were conditions uh that were placed or put forward by the, the local were just approval as presented. So we have a, a motion. Do you have a second? I'll second that. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All right, 
Mr. Pettit, please call roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson. No. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Kalikia. Yes. Director Collier. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Ms. Trott. Yes, but I would encourage the developer to continue to review the roof lines of this building and try to bring down the scale of this to help it in um, lend in with the neighborhood. Madam Chair, the vote passes uh, seven to two. I'd like to thank everyone for your time and effort and your thoughtfulness related to this project. Um, we, as we mentioned to the Hessler neighborhood, we're committed to starting the conversation to really um, bring you, you into the conversation uh, and determine the best avenue to do that. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. It's been a long road. Thank yes, you. Thank you, everyone. We'll now move on to our fifth applicant, um, which is located at the Woodhill Development Site on at 1885 Coleman Road, aka the 1862 East 122nd Street, new construction of townhouses and apartment building. Could the applicant please use the raised hand function, open up your mic and announce yourself and tell us about your project. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us again. Uh, my name is Brad Nosen. I'm with uh, City 6 Development on behalf of the development team. I also have uh, Michael Panzica with M. Panzica Development, um, Brandon Klein from Geist Construction and GLSD Architects, as well as our townhome partners, uh, Kinez, I believe Hannah uh, Cohen uh, Plessner is on this from Kinez, and Gustav Development, and then their design team, Sixmo. Um, it's nice to see everybody again. Thank you for having us. Um, we are going to, you know, well, I'm going to walk you through kind of the, the history of the site. I know most of, you know, the history of the site, and then I'll pass it over to Brandon. And, um, Pat Thornton with, uh, six Mo, um, get to talk about the design aspects, but I want to kind of give you, uh, again, a sense for the geography, uh, where the sites, uh, where the site exists, um, and. The history of it and kind of how we've gone through this whole process because I've actually really enjoyed this process. I think um, between University Circle and Little Italy Design Review, um, it's been a really um, it's been a really good one, a really collaborative one, and it's been a very clear process for I think everybody involved. So um, to begin, um, obviously you guys know that the Woodhill Development Site is about a slightly over a two acre site located between East 123rd Street and Coltman Road. You'll see it highlighted here. Um, it's on the northerly side of Little Italy. It's bounded by Lakeview Cemetery um, on the northeasterly portion, and then Coltman Road on the northwesterly, let's say. And then University Circle lies just to the north with the University Circle Police Department, um, as well as the Artist Archives of the Western Reserve and the Western Reserve um, Artist Archives and Sculpture Studio uh, just to the north with the neighborhood to the south. Go to the next slide, please. So historically, um, for a very long time, the site was an industrial site. You had the former Woodhill Supply Building here. Um, looking through these photos, you'll see uh, many instances in which this industrial building came right up to the streetscape um, along 123rd and along Coltman. Um, for example, on number three, you'll see the old industrial building directly across from the Coltman townhomes, which were built um, at this point quite some time ago. Um, so this building kind of existed here historically um, until it was burnt down. Uh, it, it burnt down a few years ago. Next slide, please. The existing conditions are, it's really a large open brownfield site. Um, the only thing that remains of the previous building is on the south side of the site, which is a uh, masonry wall and fence with a uh, wooden fence sitting on top of it. Um, that runs along the neighborhood side and the rest of the 
uh, site is a brownfield. Um, we have, you know, done our phase one and phase two, and there are some uh, environmental, there's some environmental remediations that need to happen. Um, luckily, we're not as uh, severe as we thought, which is a good thing, uh, but there is something that will have to happen, uh, which ultimately will be a uh, plus for the site. Next slide, please. Uh, these give you some context photos for uh, similarly massed uh, developments around University Circle and Little and Little Italy. Next slide, please. So I wanted to kind of talk about how we came to this um, project uh, last year, uh, middle uh, towards the end of 2020. Uh, University Circle sent out an RFP to uh, uh, developers. Uh, our, our first iteration looked something close to uh, number one here, uh, which was a five story building. And this in the upper left hand corner was a five story building. It was four stories over concrete. Um, at the time, they were, you know, some of the things that University Circle was interested in was uh, the ability to have traffic which passed through the site. So we had a street there. And also, they wanted us to provide some for sale housing as well as some green space. Um, you can see the green space on the left hand side of number one um, that was to include a sculpture park and a dog garden um, a dog a sculpture garden a dog park um, and then also some forest sale town homes which we're going to lie in coltman um, one of the when we presented this to the community the sort of obvious first piece of feedback we got is why not switch the large massing of the building away from the neighborhood side of the uh, of the site and towards uh, the more industrial, let's call it the industrial side. So that took us to uh, number two, which came about in November of that year, where we flipped the building and provided a little more space between the neighbors. Um, again, through the neighborhood and through the little early design review, um, the feeling was um, that we needed a little more, we needed to bring the massing of the building down. Um, and so that brought us to the phase three, where we actually saw a skinnier sort of building, a little more efficient layout. Um, you've got a stronger curvature in that street. We still maintained some green space uh, to be used for the public. Um, and we still had nine townhomes. And we also had the uh, creation of an additional uh, green space along Coltman Road. Uh, you'll see on the southerly, southwesterly portion of Coltman Road, and that was going to be a play area. So we wanted to kind of um, create a little more space between the project and uh, the rest of the neighborhood. Um, again, we received additional feedback from Little Italy and Little Italy Design Review in the neighborhood um, that they thought the building was too big. And at, at this time, it had 105 units. It was almost 60 feet tall. Um, we had nine townhomes there, and it was five stories tall at this time. So. We had a very kind of serious conversation with the stakeholders in the area, and the general thought was we need more for sale housing, and we need to move this building away from the center of the uh, site. And that gave us our current configuration number four. Um, we've chopped about 25 units off of the multifamily plan. Um, building is down to 45 feet. Uh, we're providing 80 parking spaces for the 80 apartment units, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, we've almost doubled the amount of townhomes to 17 townhomes. You have four on uh, 123rd, which about the neighborhood, and then another 13 along Coltman Road. Um, after speaking with you know some stakeholders and Little Italy and University Circle, it didn't seem as necessary to provide a uh, uh, a driveway or a, a road through the site. But they did want to help create you know increased circulation on the site, pedestrian circulation. So you'll see. A, uh, we've connected the sculpture garden um, on the northern portion of the site to Coltman Road so that pedestrians can kind of circulate through the site and that sculpture garden will be open to the public. Um, and, you know, we hope to work with the um, sculpture, sculpture center, artist archives to um, and the neighborhood to kind of curate that site and come up with um, sculptures, which will um, represent um, the arts district in that area and, and the arts of University Circle, as well as the history of Little Italy. Uh, we've also maintained a dog park and a currently a play area on the southerly side part, portion of the site. We did receive some feedback uh, from some of the neighbors that they thought that 
perhaps um, the play area was not necessary and a larger dog park uh, would be beneficial or even a, um, you know, just a, a public park as well as a dog park there. So those are things that we are um, very interested in talking with uh, the community about and coming up with some sort of community committee to figure out how do we best uh, uh, create this site. Um, next slide, please. These are the historic uh, renderings. You'll see kind of one through three. You'll have the various iterations of the building. This is looking down um, uh, 123rd with the uh, cemetery wall to your right. And now we are in the position on rendering four where you have uh, the townhomes for sale townhomes um, uh, next to the other for sale product, uh, single family for sale product in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Again, this is a view looking down Coltman, looking towards uh, the heart of Little Italy, away from University Circle. Um, again, we had the townhomes there. You can see the larger building um, on that original kind of cut through street uh, throughout iterations one through three. And now we've moved away from the large building in that section of the site. And we have uh, all nine. You'll see that's a section of, uh, I think that's nine townhomes that line Coleman directly across from the Coleman townhomes, which exists there. Next slide, please. And this is where I will turn it over to Brandon from Geis, as well as uh, Pat Thornton from Sixmo to speak about the designs. Uh, thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Brad, uh, and, and thanks for the commission. Uh, looking forward to uh, talking through this. Uh, we very excited that. Uh, we're here. Uh, we've been through many iterations and many discussions with many different agencies uh, and, and neighborhoods and committees uh, to get to this point. Uh, so just a quick, uh, quick item. We are going to be uh, hopefully heard at BZA on June 7th for two variants requests for this development. Um, one is an area density uh, for the apartment building, uh, parcel A. Uh, and then also a parking space uh, size dimensionally uh, reduction from a nine foot wide space to an eight foot six space to achieve a one to one parking ratio. Uh, next slide. Uh, so overall site plan, I know Brad alluded to it in the iterations, but uh, some changes that have occurred or further developments have occurred since the last time we came uh, in front of Landmarks Commission. Uh, we pulled the uh, apartment building uh, off of 123rd. Uh, as much as we possibly could, uh, we presently have a six to eight foot setback, depending on the projection locations uh, along 23rd. Uh, requirement along East 123rd is a five foot setback, um, similarly uh, to four townhomes as well. Uh, we are mimicking and matching relatively the setbacks that are up and down that street. Um, everything to the north of this site uh, is pretty much almost near a zero line setback to two foot setback. And then most of the residential complexes heading towards uh, and, and houses heading towards uh, on 123rd, uh, close to the Mayfield, all pretty much aligned with that five foot setback, as you can see in this hill. Um, along uh, Coltman, uh, the townhomes as well are at a five foot setback off of that street. Um, other items that have been changed and moved we, we relocated the permeable paver location and also increased that amount of permeable pavers. Uh, to break up that center large uh, uh, 61 space parking space lot. Uh, in addition to, we were able to uh, tweak and adjust uh, to ensure that we had two landscape islands on both sides flanking that 61 space lot. Uh, in addition to bringing two diamond landscape uh, uh, to right in the center of that, that double park area. Uh, in addition, we uh, moved and relocated the gates to being all internal to the site, leaving the drive access. Uh, in an open, unsecure location or, or condition, um, keeping a, a secured parking lot only for the 61 spaces um, so that it didn't feel uh, as private and as gated as some of the comments and feedback were uh, provided. Um, as Brad noted, we have two green spaces at the uh, two corners of the uh, of this site development, the Sculpture Park, uh, which is meant to be a um, public, uh, you know, public, semi-public uh, component to the project. Um, something that we, uh, although have further uh, evolved the design in this presentation, our intentions are to uh, engage with uh, city shareholders um, and city agencies to further refine and, and, and define uh, 
uh, the need and desire. I know that there's been some comments about that Sculpture Park uh, alluding to uh, the history of the Little Italy District, and we're very open to those discussions uh, and aspects. Uh, along with the play area and dog park, I think that there's been some discussions about maybe omitting or leaving uh, the play area out and just making a much larger uh, dog park area. We're also very open to that discussion and dialogue um, as we continue to progress. But obviously, those two elements uh, are, are farther down the line in the uh, construction uh, sequencing. Um, next slide. Um, here's just a technical site plan, obviously locating and providing some of the dimensions of those setbacks as we already uh, alluded to. Um, next slide. Just an overall plan for context of uh, the apartment units uh, and, and what the uh, size and makeup uh, is. Uh, next slide. Um, I'll let Pat talk about this uh, overall plan uh, of one of our typical townhomes uh, on the site. Um, just was requested to be included. Yeah, uh, this was along the, along the path. Uh, some, it was requested that we add this to the presentation. Uh, these are typical. This is the 4 stories of the typical unit. Um, no big surprises here. Garage on the ground floor with an entry studio. Uh, providing the activation of the street level. The next level up is the living space above that's a 2 bedroom. And then the top floor has another small living space and then and then the outdoor patios. What some of the subtle changes that you'll see um, in the renderings as we get to those, you, you can recognize here in uh, plan number two there, you can see the balcony is on the back side of the building in this particular configuration. One of the changes that we've made um, through the design review process with, with all the different organizations we've been discussing with as we've started to alternate those those balconies front and back to give each unit a little bit of um, a little bit of uniqueness. You can go to the next slide. I believe we have some sections through the buildings. Again, just to demonstrate the the makeup of these units, uh, there is a a 28 inch uh, elevation off of the street. Uh, again, that's a townhouse code item. Uh, the garages are slightly lower than that, uh, depending on how the grade changes as we move along. Uh, and again, living area, uh, sleeping area, and then another living area up top. And then here you'll see another one of the subtle changes that we've made is we've actually sloped the divider wall, the privacy wall between units. We've sloped that, and you'll note that on the when we get to the renderings, uh, that's in an, in, in an effort to uh, reduce that 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 rigid sawtooth view um, from the from the ground level perspective. I think the next slide is back. Oh, that's still on me. As you can see here, we've <laughs> you can see uh, on the four unit building on East 123rd, um, you can see some of those changes, uh, how they impact the, the view. Again, here you can see we have front facing balconies on the outer two units. The inner two units then have the rear facing balcony on that level instead of having them all be completely uniform. We have dropped those, those walls down. Um, and it has significantly reduced that sawtooth look. And then actually on this particular building only, we did set back the, the non-stair portion of the living area to give it a little bit more relief from the neighboring building. That was one of the uh, design comments from, um, from one of the prior presentations that we had. I think you can go to the next slide. Back to Brandon. Uh, um it's a rendering view um, uh, from uh, the western side of the building and east 123rd, looking back towards the apartment building with the four unit townhouse in the, in the front corner. Um, some subtle changes that we made here obviously, we uh, added additional brick detailing, uh, that corbel uh, uh, detailing up at the top of the parapet, also at the floor lines, uh, in addition to at the, um, at the uh, headers of the windows. Uh, we also removed uh, the materials. I think at uh, both at landmarks and some of the design reviews. We we this project has gone through a considerable amount of um, process uh, because the uh, land is uh, being acquired from University Circle. Uh, we went through University Circle's design review, also Little Italy's design review, and then also had uh, two uh, neighborhood meetings uh, along with that. So um, through all that dialogue and discussion, it was noted that uh, potentially to kind of simplify. Uh, the elevation a little bit and materiality. Um, so we did increase the amount of brick uh, on the apartment building in this iteration. 
and additionally removed uh, a third material type, uh, which was a faux uh, metal wood veneer, um, faux wood uh, metal veneer uh, on the project to kind of simplify and, and tone down. Uh, I know that at our last uh, presentation, it was really spoke highly of this corner element and the feel of it being stately. Um, and so we tried to uh, integrate that into other portions of the building as well. Uh, next slide. Here's a view looking back. Um, uh, you can see the Sculpture Institute on the right, uh, and then looking back uh, back towards um, Mayfield on East 123rd. Um, and look at the, the Sculpture Park as well. Here's a view from behind the townhomes, uh, looking into the inner courtyard, uh, the amenity, residential amenity courtyard, uh, kind of tucked and nestled behind the building and between um, those industrial buildings for the, the Sculpture Institute. Uh, this is the nine unit building um, with uh, the second four unit building in the, in the background uh, along Coltman. Um, here you can, again, you can start to see the variation of front balcony to rear balcony to front balcony to rear, rear balcony, to try to give those units some individuality. In addition, we've actually taken the center three units and we've pushed them back. And the, right now we have them back about eight inches. We're studying uh, how much depth we can possibly get out of that. Um, again, that's to, to stop that plane from being a complete flat plane and giving it a little bit of relief. And also adding to a slight individuality to um, to each of these units. You could move, yeah. Again, another view from a slightly different angle. You can start to see where we've uh, doctored the photo slightly, frankly, to just to, to help indicate where those units step back and where they step back forward. Um, it doesn't buy us. We don't. We don't have a whole lot of room to slide those back. We are a very very tight site. Um, but we are squeezing every inch we can uh, out of that building to try to to um, keep this from being one big flat plane on Coleman. Four unit building. This one again, it's four. This is the, identical to the design uh, of the unit on uh, East 123rd. Uh, but again, you can start to see uh, how just lowering that divider wall slightly really really takes away from the the rigid edges of. Um, of the, the top profile of the building. The uh, material um, board of, of the apartment building itself, uh, again, there was uh, two materials uh, on the final design here. Uh, there previously were three, um, but uh, the key to this, obviously, the brick, uh, which is a large portion of the building, uh, the Cedarville, uh, we really fell in love with because of that uh, Kind of a varnished and, and very uh, heavy variation uh, in that brick. It made it look a little bit more um, historic, a little bit older, have a little bit more character, not necessarily looking like a stark new uh, new brick building uh, when it goes up. And then uh, softer, uh, more residential scale, uh, James Hardy lap siding in the Ritz Espresso. And then all the accessories uh, in the building of windows uh, uh, are, are black uh, with black railings and black balconies. Um, next slide. And again, I believe you all have seen um, all of these materials uh, once prior. We haven't made any changes to the materials themselves. We have added a view here of the, the corner detail uh, for the brick material. Um, and then we're also looking at, we're, we're studying um, some other mechanisms to get a little bit of depth out of those windows. Um, we need to determine whether the, the, the window material is compatible with some of the uh, detailing that we're studying, but we're making every effort we can to get a little bit of relief um, on these. We are making very subtle minor tweaks um, based on commentary from from not just from the last landmarks meeting, but frankly, from all of the design review process. Uh, and it's all been uh, constructive and, and it has led to a better product. Um, so, uh, some 2D yellow colored elevations showing the context of uh, adjacencies. Um, uh, I know scale has been discussed a lot. Um, if this elevation continued on, uh, on the left, you would see uh, a two-story house that has a three-story roof, so that the townhomes fill very much in line with 
um, the context, the house directly adjacent to us is, is a one story unique uh, house in comparison to the neighborhood uh, itself. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, some, uh, new, uh, new to what we didn't present last time was uh, some of the site lighting details. Um, the intent here is, is to provide a, a lighting more at a pedestrian scale, um, not uh, trying to minimize the amount of uh, light utility poles um, throughout the, the parking lot area. We've, we've placed four uh, as minimally as we feel we can uh, to provide adequate safety light. Um, uh, it was noted uh, during our, our design review presentation that they would request that we would not uh, allow for uh, any of the site lighting to be over 14 foot high. Uh, we mentioned that these were intended to be 20 foot poles. We had no issue with that adjustment. Um, we'll do a photometric plan just to make sure that we're getting the same uh, appropriate light scale at that. And if, if we find that we need to add a pole or um, make an adjustment, we will. All the green dots are all the uh, site lighting bollards, again, to try to publicly light these pathways. Uh, we have full connection from East 123rd to Coltman on the uh, left side of this site um, so that people can get from one side to the other. Uh, and then some wall packs and entry stances. Um, another item that came up through uh, neighborhood meetings uh, was us to take a look at possibly trying to integrate something that would be a little bit more, speak a little bit more to um, Little Italy's, you know, design uh, as far, a little bit maybe more historic feel than uh, some of this lighting that's a little bit more modern. We said that was something we would explore. Um, there was a comment of, of trying to not get too themed, but at the same time provide something that you know has an appropriate. So uh, we talked about potentially maybe a stagecoach style or a lantern style or uh, post lantern style lighting to maybe uh, create that as something that we uh, agreed to and that we would um, take a further, further look at uh, as we evolve. Um, next slide. And then lastly, a landscape plan. Um, as mentioned, we're not uh, coming really for finals on, on Sculpture Park or the um, dog park and play area. We we want to continue to have dialogue with uh, the neighborhood and then also with the public and some uh, agency shareholders. But uh, the key to this uh, was obviously we, we're very tight on the site. We're trying to give uh, as much relief as we possibly can. But at the same time, as we mentioned, uh, the development team has been very uh, understanding of the request by this, uh, the neighborhood uh, and has, has been willing to you know, reduce the density of this down to 80 uh, multifamily units from originally proposed at 105, um, and then increase the amount of townhomes to um, 17. And really, we're at kind of that absolute limit of what would make a, a feasible project um, at that density. So, by trying to create uh, all this program on this small site, uh, you know, we're trying to create as much relief as we can, as Pat mentioned. Um, the uh, the pullback in the middle of the the nine unit uh, townhouses, uh, same thing on the multifamily side that you know on East 123rd, stay as far away from the street as we possibly can, but still have ease and uh, uh, access uh, requirements and and parking access to get in and out of garages and in and out of parking spaces. Uh, next, that might be it though. I'll just a blow up detail of. Uh, at department entries uh, off the street on 123rd, and then also the townhome entries um, as, a, as a typical, and then some details on the play area. I think the next slide might be the blow up of or just some typical plantings. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. So, uh, it, so I'd like to bring up just uh, the, there were three items of conditional approval that were brought up at, at Little Italy. Um, which we were approved to move forward on. Uh, the intention was that we would continue to refine the design. Um, our stress uh, to, to that organization and, and committee was that uh, we're trying to progress uh, through landmarks uh, and also BZA to be able to start development of the site. Uh, we do have some environmental uh, remediation that needs to occur and obviously um, be able to get moving on construction. Um, in the near future, but we were committed to continuing to evolve the design. Um, one item was to fine tune proportions in, of the materials and siding uh, and potential integration of some additional detailing. Um, items that we kind of talked about or suggested would be maybe adding 
uh, a CMU uh, Wainscoat course or uh, at either the uh, some of the peers uh, that get created uh, and or potentially where we have some larger volumes of um, lap siding to be able to raise the brick up a little bit. Um, we mentioned that we really added about 15% brick in this iteration and we're really kind of at the, the limit of what the, the development can, can sustain. Um, but potentially adding that CMU might allow us to make the building feel a little bit more um, uh, rich environment uh, with minimizing some of that, that hardy. Um, in addition, we talked about maybe the window detailing. It might be uh, we would uh, investigate potentially adding some window trim uh, around uh, those windows to maybe create a little bit more substantial feel than uh, the current size. Their, their concern was that the windows felt small. We stressed that they were six by seven, so they weren't small windows by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there was also some discussion about adding windows, and we noted that it was a challenge because of uh, interior layouts of uh, bedrooms and living room demising. Um, that the windows are kind of spaced in the center of the room um, for that. So uh, we told them we would look through that, uh, the site lighting pole that we had mentioned uh, in lighting study. And then um, lastly, their, their comments were to allow us to move forward to uh, landmarks and BZA that we could progress site foundation uh, and environment. Uh, happy to open uh, the floor to any questions, comments, or other people need to speak. Excellent, thank you. I uh, appreciate the presentation. Um, before I, uh, we move forward, I just wanna make a quick comment on, I have to step away personally for a few minutes, so I'm going to hand the meeting over to Giancarlo to lead. Um, but I think the next in, uh, point of feedback we'd like is the, uh, any feedback from the local committee since our last review. Hi, good morning, it's Ray Christosik from Little Italy Redevelopment Corporation. Um, I think I wanted to talk about the process because I think this was very important on this project. So late last year, we had stakeholder meetings with adjacent property owners, um, which really kind of helped to shape the direction where we, we were into today. Uh, we also formed a small working group with the development team, UCI, in our organization. Uh, for conceptual review, we had a public Zoom for uh, comments. It was, um, it was well attended um, before it went to our design review committee and landmarks. The team and then took that information and went back sort of to the drawing board and um, kind of put together the final package, uh, which you're seeing today. That same package went to the full community the design review committee um, on Monday night. Um, our committee was was always concerned with a few things. Was the scale, how it interfaced with the properties on East, the existing properties on East 123rd and Coltman, uh, the makeup of units, the departments versus the, the townhomes. Um, and the development team, I think, kind of really um, took those concerns seriously. The scale, uh, they went to a surface parking lot, which in turn, they didn't have to use a podium and the building height was reduced considerably with that change. Um, I know the parking lot, the open parking lot was, is, is a concern to some, but I think the overall scale of the project benefits from making that change. Um, how it interfaced with the property owners on 123rd in Coltman, and I think moving the um, townhomes closer to there and moving the apartment builder building closer to the sculptural center, which is you know towards Euclid more, I think um, was 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 good for the property owners on on those two streets. We were always we always strive to provide more for sale product in the neighborhood. And I think the development team kind of, you know, agreed with us and lowered the number of apartments from 100, over 100 to 80 and increased the number of townhomes from 9 to 17, which um, I think adds a nice mix to that, to the amount of townhomes or for sale product in the area. Um, the committee voted uh, Monday night to approve the project with the conditions that Brandon 
uh, outlined right before I spoke. I'm speaking, and uh, with, you know, look at those minor kind of uh, you know design issues, but the scale or the the the, the massing of the buildings, I think the committee was fine with. At the one thing, I think this project brings a lot of life to an, un, an abandoned, unsafe. Uh, part of the uh, on edge of the community was was a what was a warehouse that um, or an older warehouse that burned down that you know didn't add any life or livelihood to that part of the neighborhood and um, and I like to thank all the parties uh, the the development team the UCI my committee members and and the, and the people of the community for being part of this process and I think at the end of the day. I think we've come up with something that that's gets that'll be good for the community. So thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, or or, or our Vice Chair, whoever's in, in the chair right now. I, I Chris Ronan, UCI. I just wanted to uh, say, as the property owner um, who uh, is letting the property out to um, the future owner, uh, we are. Um, Lockstep with LAR, LIRC, um, Mr. Krasovic's comments um, very much we share. Uh, we entered this um, site acquisition uh, as a community benefit with the hope to take a, a site that was uh, Woodhill Supply and then endured a fire in 2015. The site was cleared and it was vacant and abandoned. So we worked with the broker to ultimately acquire it. Um, I want to say to Jim Samuels, who was the broker, he's since passed on in life, but he was a great Clevelander. So, just to Jim, um, in the subsequent years of 2015 to 21, uh, sadly, there was a, a tragic incident on the site where shots were fired. Uh, fortunately, nobody killed, but that was an indicator that we needed to activate this site. And, um, and we are glad to see this partnership of the many companies involved in this. Um, doing the work and the design and we are glad for uh, the addition of the for sale product in addition to the uh, lease product it's a nice mix um, we've had a great engagement with stakeholders and residents and would say that our encouragement always has been to meet the street at both Coleman and uh, 123rd um, I think they've done that in both cases we're particularly pleased that the added uh, 17 townhomes have um, have also uh, all met the street at the ground level and uh, parking behind. So I think the form is uh, just where we would hope it would be. Finally, the amenities um, are a nice addition. Uh, we've got constant surveys that dog parks are a great part of uh, city life. And uh, the sculpture park is uh, a nice connection to the arts district next door. And uh, we pushed and Ray as well for greater public access on site to those amenities and through and the developer and design teams uh, very much accommodated that. So we're at a moment where we think the iteration has been iterating for success and uh, we also endorse the project. Thanks. Councilman Griffin, do you have something to say? Yes, um, first of all, I support the project. I think uh, this is a welcome addition to the area. Um, I know that we really have wanted to do more development going east to the border. Um, been really working closely with East Cleveland Mayor to really try to also make sure that we renovate and develop, you know, this edge part of the city uh, with East Cleveland and also um, uh, Cle Cleveland. So I support this. I, I appreciate that the developer has um, uh, really, really. Um, you know, made the accommodations that the local design review has uh, requested. I would also, um, even though there's one for one parking and, um, you know, the one thing that I do want to make sure that I register a concern about is um, uh, somehow we work with the uh, development corporation and the property owner that even though they made one for one, even though they made one for one parking, uh, that we really are stressed as far as on street parking. Uh, so some kind of way I'd like to work with uh, UCI, uh, the local development corporation, uh, Little Italy Redevelopment Corporation and others to try to do whatever we can 
not to add to the stress of the parking situation on the street. That's why I'm glad that this person did one for one, but we still know that they have guests, that they have other, um, you know, family members and other uh, things that might precipitate them to, or might make them uh, want to, you know, provide more parking on the street. But um, I just, we're really stressed on parking on the street. So, um, so I support the project. I just want to make sure that we have ongoing conversations about how we alleviate that, uh, you know, that stress on the street. Uh, other than that, I um, look forward to working with the developer and the community uh, to continue to move this forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we can now open the, uh, for discussion of the uh, commission members. Mr. Chair, we have Mr. Strickland and Ms. Bailey with her, their hands. Chair, recognize it. Mr. Strickland, please. Thank you, uh, John Collar. I have um, a few comments and, and several questions. My comment would be, uh, I really like the design of the townhomes. Uh, personally, I think that the apartment structure is a little stark. And I do recognize the comments that were made reacting to the design review committee, where you talk about potentially adding some CMU. Um, I took that to be CMU banding. In the townhomes, it looks like there's a uh, metal frame around the windows. In some cases, there's uh, darker, it looks like metal uh, lentils and sills. Uh, I really like that detail. And if that detail could be mimicked in the apartment building, I think it would make a dramatic difference in terms of countering the, uh, what I'm gonna call starkness of the design of those punched openings as it's presently rendered. Uh, you wanna react to that? Yeah, if I could, Bob, um, I, I think we would agree with you um, on that statement. Uh, I don't believe you were able to be with us on the original presentation uh, at the at the conceptual level. Um, at that time, we had a third material, uh, and the comments were that it was a little too busy uh, and needed to be toned down a little bit. Uh, that it, it 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 needed to be a little bit more cohesive, and so when we reduced that, I think it did simplify. Uh, and so we absolutely agree with the comments of design review um, and it's part of our evolution here that we're going to try to look at uh, potentially adding, you know, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, CMU uh, wainscoat basically at the base uh, or, at, you know, at the base of the building or whether it's just through peers to try to, you know, create a little bit more of that. Uh, I think it was comment by one of the commission members last time was it, to make it feel that, that more stately look that has on that corner uh, and then uh, Similar to that approach with the uh, with the townhomes, the, the the casing that's around um, those windows uh, to allow those windows to feel a little bit more emphasized on that facade. Um, so those are those are our big action items. Okay, and I would be fine with uh, you making those adjustments and just presenting them to staff for final review. Uh, I have some technical questions. Um, are the townhomes are they? Be simple, or is there an HOA? Is there any lot splits involved? The, the townhomes will be sold fee simple, and there will be an HOA that man, maintains them overall. So, won't there be individual lots uh, for those fee simple transactions for the townhomes? I don't see lot splits. Uh, yes, yeah, we will, we would come back to the city with the plat for that when we're further along. All right, so with that answer, uh, the HOA then would be responsible for the maintenance of any common property associated with the townhomes. It's not depicted what is common to the townhomes and what's part of the uh, apartment. Yeah, department. Carl, if you, if you go to the technical site plan, um, there's three parcels uh, that are going to be initially broke. Or basically, currently there's uh, two parcels of land uh, that'll be consolidated into three parcels, parcel A, parcel B, which is runs along entirely of Coltman Road, and then parcel C, which is the, the corner four units uh, on East 123rd. Um, so you can kind of see those, the, the initial parcels, and then as Hannah's alluding to, uh, once that occurs, uh, there'll be um, a division of the townhomes as well on those parcels B and C. 
Um, there'll be shared access agreements uh, that will be written in uh, to the legal descriptions uh, for obviously these access roads and access ways. Um, uh, because obviously the 16 parking space is still left uh, behind the apartment building and behind the townhomes, you know, we'll be sharing that same access drive that's part of parcel B. Um, likewise, the ingress off of Coltman uh, and off of East 123rd as well. So. All right. And uh, so I've just blown up the site on my screen a little bit so I can see the delineation of the parcels now. I could not pick that up before. Um, where is the uh, dumpster location and how is trash going to be um, dealt with for both the townhomes and the apartment building? So in the apartment building, it's actually all internal to the building. Uh, there's a, a trash room that would be um, along East 123rd near the entrance. Um, kept in an internal room with an, that double door access um, outside. Um, the room's tucked in, not right at the edge of the building. The, there's an electrical room first um, on the internal layout. Uh, basically, where it says proposed building, it's it's the where it's the P and uh, the second P in proposed. Uh -huh. um, that block is uh, a bunch of utility rooms, including a trash room and a trash chute that drops down in that location. So there's like a service drive that accesses that room. It looks like the park is is there. You're talking on the north side, the um, left hand side of the building. Uh, so there's, uh, if you look at where it says proposed building parcel A, um, uh -huh. there's a there's a pair of double oh, doors oh, that oh. recess to the outside. Um, I guess. And uh, all the trash should be held in a small uh, small room within that larger room block. All right. Okay. So the, the service vehicle will access that right off of directly off of West 123rd. Right. And then for the, for the townhomes, it would be a private trash collection that's managed by the HOA. All right. And uh, snow removal, how is that going to be handled on this site? I don't think we've worked through all that detail. I'd assume that uh, it probably would want to be most likely be a common snow removal for the entire development. Um, but uh, the intention of actual, if the question is, where are we going to place or uh, right. stack snow? Um, that's the intention of why the parking lot was held off so much of the property line on the, on the uh, west side uh, or southwest side. Um, I think we have about uh, 12 feet uh, of land. Um, that's lightly landscaped between uh, the existing masonry wall that was left in place with a board on board fence. Um, there is a large grade change between the adjacent property uh, and our property. Um, there's about a three to three and a half foot difference between um, the adjacent residence and our property line. That existing brick wall would stay in place with the board on board fence. And we'd right. be so I just, uh, I would encourage you to, to study that aspect of the uh, efficiency of dealing with this site in the winter time and just make sure that it's practical. Yeah, I, I mean, I will say that the the, the diamond landscape uh, in the middle of the parking lot is we cringe at just because it makes it for a challenge for any kind of site logistics of snow plowing. But we understood the comments from design review and 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 the neighbors and. This is kind of the way to to be able to add some landscape without uh, disturbing parking quantity. Gotcha. And to address the councilman's concern about parking, um, is there available on-site parking on West 120? I mean, East 123rd and uh, Coleman or on street? Yeah. Um, both streets are do have on-street parking, um, but obviously that's not part of our. Our parking count. No, but it could um, provide some relief for it, it, visitors, guests. It, it could. I know that that's. I know that that's been a, a a big topic for the neighborhood and and residents and neighbors. Knowing you know councilman's comments, but obviously if anyone's been in Little Italy, it's it's a challenge to park on the street in parallel parking situation. So. Gotcha. But I think just yeah, yes, it, but yes, it could. This is Michael Panzica. Yes. Yep. Sure. Yep. Right. Okay, that's great. That uh, that addresses all my comments. I think it's a wonderful project. It's going to be a great asset for the community in that neighborhood. 
Thank you. Mr. Chair, we have Ms. Bailey with her hand raised. Mr. Bailey, please uh, yeah, see the hand raised. Ms. Safety. Am I the last or is it someone else? It is you. Go ahead, yeah, please. All right. Uh, well, thank you um, for making the adjustment from the last time that um, we made. Uh, could we go to one of the elevation? And I have a comment on the roof. Um, keep going, keep going uh, for the townhouse. I'm gonna start off with that. Just keep going. Now uh, go to another elevation. Yeah, this would be fine. Yeah, this is good enough. Uh, one of the comments that we made, um, the dividers that separate unit on the roof, um, one of the comments were made for the dividers to set it back a little from the roof. Um, I understand that we want to show privacy, but that isn't necessary to have it all the way to the edge. Uh, just to set it back just slightly. Uh, that was one of the comments that was made from the um, commission. Um, also, I'm looking at that gutter. Now, I know this is a perspective drawing, so I know it's not that big. So, <laughs> so I'm just commenting on the roof gutter. So, is that what type of is that an actual roof gutter up there? What is that? At the top, that's yeah, actually not. Top, it, it looks top. a little bit like a giant gutter there, but that's but just a it? slight overhang. It's got what a small. It? It's just a slight overhang. Uh -huh. and a small gutter, uh, uh, shedding water up there. But that that component you're seeing is not a giant gutter. That's, that's okay. Uh, thank you. All reason. right. I'm just, like I'm just hoping it's not that. So I know you know what you're doing. So um, okay. But one of the comment we made was about how far out is that divider, and if you can just set it back. From the edge, um, uh, so that was one in the item. Mean, if you can just look at that, and um, that was what we made a comment on. And could you just go to one of the apartment elevation? And um, like this is a good example, and it doesn't matter which one. Now again, I commend you on this entire project, and I like what everyone is doing on it. Um, I just wonder if have you just studied the material use as far as uniform of the material? For example, this is a good example. Um, why didn't you, for example, the elevations that's not set back on the base that's coming out and the ones that's set back or the ones that's taller than the others, it can be um materials on uh, the red brick can be at a certain height and the ones that set back like the ones second from the right can be lower i'm just trying to figure out what you're trying to do with the material and the elevation or you could just make it all brick it all the way at the top and then maybe the ones set back can be halfway i'm just trying to see have you studied the elevation wise the ones in the back you have the red brick going one story why not have it at the same height as the one in the front so that's what i'm looking at um consistency uh, in the building have you looked at all that as far as all your elevation well um i guess it, we, we've done numerous uh, material studies and and throughout this process, uh, also with different materials, different material types. Obviously, uh, projects like this in the region of 105 units to 80 units is, is made uh, perform a you know, tight in regards to uh, losing that density. So um, we've tried to balance uh, the amount of brick, obviously brick being the most expensive material on this project uh, for, for the apartment building. And, and utilize it in locations that that have meaning or significance. So yes, we, we did minimize it on the backside because it's not public facing, it's not facing a street. Um, but we know, also knew that it needed to be carried around, and that's why on the backside of the building, it's it's more at a one-story elevation and not carried above that. 
uh, we tried to sign signify and, 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 and denote the, the main entrance. And then obviously what we felt was very important and significant was the uh, southern uh, corner along one, uh, 123rd um, in that elevation. Um, so uh, we, we took a lot of uh, discussions. I think uh, Bob's comment, you know, also mimics obviously uh, the design review comments that we saw. Um, and I think that this building will be extremely balanced once we start adding a little bit more significant feel to those windows than right now. They're kind of understated. Um, and, and I think that that will change this elevation pretty significantly. But yeah, take a look at the um, the roof, the divide out, because one of the comment is to try to move it from the roof edge and just set it back. Um, I understand you want to have privacy, but but I'm not saying to set it back too far all the way so that the neighbors won't be seeing each other. But just take a look at that and just work with staff on it. But otherwise, the whole entire project, we did a good job on it. So that's all my comments that I see on my notes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Any other comments from the commission? Mr. Chair, Mr. Benezzi has his hand raised. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'll keep my comments to uh, short, but as the theme of the day seems to be uh, communication with the community. So I would like to commend the developer and the whole team on the, the um, sensibility to, you know, all the different review boards and all the different processes and coming up with what, in my opinion, is going to be a very um, substantial and um, productive new development in Little Italy, one of my personal favorite commun uh, communities as an Italian. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, my only comment was uh, really was, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, was, was mo mostly just commending the project. I wanted to give a quick comment that I support the process of, uh, if you could go a few more slides, Carl. Um, to the townhomes, especially with the townhomes, being sensible to um, the scale of, of as you move down um, Coltrane and and using the setbacks as a way to, uh, you know, kind of not overwhelm the community with the gigantic mass and and just the whole sensibility of the material palette. It's, it doesn't seem um, overly clunky. It's it's clean and and um, not overbearing and. And I agree with um, fellow member uh, Strickland's comment about looking at the window detailing and carrying that from the um, townhomes back to the uh, larger multifamily building and, and kind of running that through staff and making sure that those types of little tweaks and changes are um, carried forth. But overall, I, I do commend the project and, and the great sensibility that you had in communicating with the community and making sure that everyone felt involved. So. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments from the committee? Mr. Chair, Ms. Anderson has her hand raised. Please go ahead, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I really appreciate the developers making um, some Great improvements to the design uh, to, of this uh, project. I I really liked what they've done uh, since we uh, last saw it as a concept. I have one comment to make, and th this is regarding the apartment building, um, at least on a design-wise. I uh, um, not the back side, the front side. Okay, th I think that'll help. Um, it's probably not the perfect photo, but. Um, I realize that brick is expensive and you you mentioned that you maximized the brick and you added 15% more brick and I really like things details like the corbeling uh, I think it really enhances the overall look I just would like to see a little more symmetry in the um the corner on the right hand side is fully brick and I would like to see that same symmetry carried through to the uh, corner on the left hand side of this photograph. That that I think would really enhance the look of the building and it would um, make it more uh, balanced and symmetrical. 
Um, if, if I can ask the question, are you saying when you say the left side, the right side, are you still saying this front corner? Yes, the front corner here in this photo. So, so basically, the front side of the left corner of the building and the back side of the corner of the of, of that of. Um. In, in other words, are we still talking about the same that same? We're not talking about this, this corner here. I like. It's the opposite corner on, yes, that side of the building. That's exactly what I'm referring to. Hey, the last photo that I was commenting on. Can you go back to, uh, yeah, that's one. Okay, okay. yes. This, okay, yes, yes, um, Commissioner Bailey. This, this quadrant of the building, uh, this corner here, yeah, I would, I would think it would enhance the building if the brick. I know it's expensive to go all the way up and mimic the opposite corner. Um, I also, I'm also concerned about it. The black siding, I think, is a, just a, a little stark. Uh, the rest of the building is fairly warm. It uh, really uh, speaks to the uh, abundance of brick in the neighborhood. I, I think um, could probably revisit the black siding. Uh, well, I can, I, I guess everything, everything has give and take, right? I, I know that from a cost perspective, we're, we're stretched as much as we possibly can for materialities on this. Um, but what we might be able to do is kind of, you know, uh, trade a little bit here uh, and take a look at the quantities that maybe where that balcony is on that uh, corner. Uh, and then maybe steal the quantity from less of that balcony on the second floor to to create that same corner I think you like so much on the other side. Um, I can't say we've done considerable amount of color uh, scheme and evolutions of this project. We had a warm cream, we had a, a beige, we've had um, other siding colors, uh, and it, the, the cool gray actually in the Rich Espresso gave um, the best approach, and we even ran that by a handful of design review members and others. Uh, who all pushed kind of to this direction, um, but uh, we can take a look at it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that would that would be my suggestion. Um, I also have a concern about the parking. Um, I'm not sure where the mail truck will go, the Amazon delivery, the FedEx, uh, a contractor who's working on you know maintenance. Not sure where they would go. I I don't think we can rely on overflow parking on uh, East 123rd because that that parking is already well utilized. Uh, so I'm a little concerned about kicking the potential parking issues down the kicking that can down the road. Uh, so yeah, I mean, most of those where that, transient where the mail truck will go that kind of thing. Most of those transient uses uh, are done during the day when parking counts are. are you know, a lot different than overnight for an apartment building. Um, but also a lot of times the mail truck, first the mail truck won't leave their mail truck unattended in a non-visible location. I think it's one of the requirements of um, the postal code. Um, but uh, we typically see them just pull and, you know, into the driveway and, and leave their car with flashers on. Um, uh, you know, and, and again, that was also, if you can go to the site plan, that's also why we pulled all the parking gates internal to the site. Um, was to ensure that there was queuing and opportunity for people to pull in and pull out um, in, in a setting that wasn't secure um, to alleviate that. Yeah, well, I just hope that driveway is wide enough so that uh, these kind of delivery vehicles can park there with their flashers on and, and other vehicles can still move around them. Yeah. I mean, it's all two-way traffic except for the one um, road out uh, nine townhouse unit is all one way. Um, outside of that, everything is two way. All right, well, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank well, you. Anyone else? Mr. Chair, we have no other hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to make some comments I, um, in conjunction with what uh, Ms. Anderson just stated. Um, one of the issues I have is this this dark color, the black. You're calling it gray, but it reads uh, quite black to me. I think 
just in general, um, personally, I'm getting a little tired of every building that's going up in Cleveland in the last couple of years has black everywhere. They just build a half a dozen in Tremont, black, black, black. I like it as a color, but, but I think it's in Little Italy, we need some color. One of them, the most interesting features I find in that, it, you know, Italian architecture is this color and maybe even some striping. I think the brick, um, even though I agree with Michelle, a little more brick, but, probably, but I'm not as, as you know, um, as committed to more brick. Um, but I would like to see some color, some relief to this dark, um, contrast to the, to the, to the pinkish brick. Um, I mean, uh, like a dark green or even a, a burgundy would be, I think, much more appropriate for a little Italy. Um, any thoughts on that particular issue? Um, so I'll, I'll just. Yeah, so I'll just respond from a from I guess the process and and feedback from the little little Italy design review. Um, you know, we received the approval with the conditions that we could come back and look at some of the articulations um, on the building, um, as well as there were some comments made about the the color of the of the siding. Um, wow. And you know, I, I remember Brandon mentioned that um, you know we had a few iterations kind of uh, behind the scenes, um, and that those were things that we could. Um, work with uh, the local design review and explore some of the various options um, for that. And that's something, you know, um, we're, we're committed to continue working with the community um, and figuring out, you know, what what is a, once we get into these more uh, finite, um, des these more fine design aspects, right, like color and, and windows and um, CMUs, et cetera, that's something we'll continue working with the neighborhood. Uh, we've been working with them for six, seven months, then it's been a great relationship so far. So I'd like to continue that um, and continue getting their feedback um, on the design review side. So I, I'm open to exploring some other um, options as well. So suggesting that you would come back to the landmarks uh, for, uh, for, uh, for approval on that, or how will you handle that particular item? Our preference would be to work with work with staff and work with uh, the local design review, but yeah, stamp. Right. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Mr. Chair, Ms. Anderson has her hand raised again. Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, I, I'm supportive of this project, but it, I think it would really be great if you revisited that dark gray, almost black color. It's it's kind of foreboding and, you know, let's face it. we. We're, we have so much gray in the skies. We have months where it's continuously gray. Just something that, <laughs> to give it a little more warmth and make it a little more welcoming. Uh, I think the um, that dark gray is sort of industrial and kind of cold. Uh, so yeah, I, I I support the project. I think it's uh, you've made some great um, improvements, but. Yeah, I, I want to really emphasize that I think that color needs to be revisited. Sure, absolutely. happy to take a yeah, ha happy to take a look at the the, the color scheme. Um, obviously, the materials and materials of color can be easily uh, adjusted and see see what comes up with uh, you know if, if it warms up the building or feel you know that feel especially this point or so. Um, we're very open to that discussion. Yes, I do think you know it's a very very inspiring project. It's going to be a substantial change to that part of the community and a great addition to the community of Little Italy. But I agree that I think we need some some color, some relief, and some um, you know even as I look at this rendering, you know the, the blue, the green, the white, you know it just seems like it needs um, some further inspiration and color. Uh, mostly color, I think, you know, just you know, maybe even some kind of a striping effect, which is a very significant architectural feature in Italy. And um, so those are my general comments. And I'm, I'm okay with uh, coming back to the two, uh, two staff for a final approval. So with that in mind, I think we're ready to call uh, for a vote. Uh, Mr. Patton, please go ahead. I'll make a motion. Okay, we need a motion. Thank you. All right. Um, I make a motion to move the um, um, 
application as presented with the uh, uh, the developer to just look at the uh, the corner that we are uh, looking at right now. Just look at the um, option of uh, making that all red book, red the color, and also um, when you do um, as you go through the process of looking at the color um, for the final color. Um, also look at have involved the local um, design review as well as the staff, and also include site visit. Um, so we can um, look at the color, you know, in, out in the site. So you can out in the um, out in the field, so they can see the color. But also um, have staff look at that as well as the local review, and also um, look at the like I mentioned about the townhouse. Take a look at possible moving those divider away from the edge of the roof. Look at that because that was also mentioned at the last meeting, and that's my just slightly. I didn't just say fully all the way, but just slightly move that away, and that's it. That's part of motion. Thank you. Well, before we finish the second, I think there's some comments were made by Mr. Strickland regarding the windows and carrying some of those details around the windows. I think we should include that in a motion as well. I'll include that as well with the windows. All right, we have a second. second that motion. Okay, we have a second, and then we can call for a vote. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonazzi. Yes. Mr. Colicchio. Yes. Mr. Santoro. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank you very much, everyone. Wonderful presentation. Um, moving forward to the next item on the list. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Bye. 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 Our next item on the list is case 21018, Franklin West Clinton Historic District. Um, we are ready for the presentation. Please move forward. So um, I believe we uh, we already proposed this. It was waiting because it was already installed. Okay. I believe. Uh, Mr. Mr. Yes. Chair, uh, Mr. Pettit had his hand raised. Thank, thank yes. you. Yeah. I just wanted to remind the commission that we tabled this on March 11th. Uh, it's a window replacement. Uh, the work was done prior to obtaining a permit or review by the commission. Uh, it was approved by the local design review committee with the exception of the material of the front windows and the four windows on the south side. Uh, at the time we reviewed this, we were lacking a photograph of the current conditions and okay. the commission uh, asked that they come back with, with those photographs. So that's, that's, why we are, that's why we're here today. Okay. Um... Then we need comments from the committee, I think. Are we ready to approve this or are there is there a further further conversation that needs to take place? Can, can the um, owner present the project because we didn't see it from the last meeting. So he could just go through the project. Are you ready prepared to do that? I mean, I have no problem going through it again. Um, so this is in a the uh, on 1458 uh, in the Franklin district. Uh, we did not pull a permit and that is universal windows directs fault at the beginning of it. And that's why we're in this situation. Um, but we were replacing 18. 
So uh, I'm at the time, um, it was just miscommunication through the production department on that end. Um, and now that's why we are in the predicament that we are now. Um, but we are a full replacement window company. Uh, we only replace custom fit um, windows down to a 16th of an inch. Um, there's 18 windows on this project and they all, um, the material that we are using um, is all 100% pure virgin vinyl, just like about 75% of the houses um, on that current street that have been replaced in the last decade um, in this historic district of Cleveland. Um, on top of it, we are replacing um, steel entry doors um, to match um, the exterior color of those entry doors um, that were currently um, already there. The windows on the project have already been installed. Um, what we are waiting on um, is to install the entry doors on this project uh, once you guys approve it. I think one of the comment was, did you have any photo of how it used to look like? So if you go back at the beginning, so that, so this was the windows in the front before, and then the photos that are now are right there on the right. And if you look at it, it's, it's uh, a lot more curb appealing uh, for the neighborhood. I do understand the Mullins and the other uh, windows, yeah, but the owner of the property itself at the time being, um, it looks at more of a fresher look um, for a nice front face with that new porch um, that they recently um, got installed as well. Um, so that's the before and afters of that front photo. Um, that's why it got tabled back on the 11th of March, I believe. Um, and that's why we're back here today. John, this is Bob Strickland. Can you review the local design review committee comments relative to this project? Do you have that available today? Sorry, I, yes, I do. Uh, the committee reviewed this uh, uh, back in March. Uh, they approved the project uh, with the exception of the front windows and the four on the south side of the house. Uh, they asked that they be aluminum clad wood windows, um, that the uh, da, da, yeah, that the large picture windows to be divided into three sashes as the original, the attic gable windows to be 50 over 50 double hung with top sashes with divided lights, the front door to be wood with either a single or dual rectangular quarter light, and that there's no arch top or eyebrow windows. All right, so this is Bob Strickland again. So I agree with all of those comments. So can the applicant explain, explain how they're going to uh, react to those comments? Are they ready to make those modifications consistent with the local design review committee comments? Well, I mean, this project was already installed. Um, so for us to, you know, take out um, the old windows or the new windows that we've already been replaced and then do the entire project over, um, that is something that we would not like to do, um, considering it, it has a, you know, a lot more of a cleaner look on the front face of that house um, than it did prior to the window installation. So for us to do the modifications and and uninstall those windows, that is not something that we would like to do, no. Well, it would be my opinion that that is absolutely what's required for this project at this point. So I would vote to reject the applicant's request for approval as, as installed. Um, what was your, okay, based on the, the local Zion resume, uh, committee comment. What was your proposal? At least trying to incorporate some of those, those, their idea. What was your proposal or 
your solution? How are you going to try to resolve their comments? Because well, I the see windows, proposal. How are you going to resolve that? Can you go to the proposal um, call? I, I'm sorry, Ms. Baylor, what exactly are you looking for? Um, is this your proposal? Is that, it's a word over here said proposal on the, on the sheet. Or is that just the existing? I'm here's, looking at the photograph. Here's what. It says proposal. Ms. Bailey. Yes. On the top photo is what was existing prior to the change. Bottom photo is what they have already installed. The local design review committee wants them to go back to a form more of what was originally there rather than what is currently installed. And they do not want them to use vinyl on that front facade. So Adrian, I believe that the applicant is requesting that we approve the project as installed without any modifications. That's the request. Uh, Mr. Strickland, I would just ask if you'd be willing to restrict your rejection to the front facade and the four windows on the on the south elevation. If you'd be willing to approve the other windows on the house. Yeah, I would approve the other windows on the house, but not the metal entry door. So it would be changing the windows on the front of the house, the four on the south, and the entry door as requested or as recommended by the uh, design review committee. Mr. Chair, Mr. Benezzi has his hand raised. Thank you. Um, I would like, I know that this was tabled at our last meeting because I don't think anyone was present. Um, but it's, just, it's frustrating because if you had been here last week, this would have been two projects that did this type of, you know, action. And I believe it, um, Mr. Tarasic clearly voiced his opinion last week. And a lot of us voiced our opinion last week about not um, being weary about projects that kind of go forward without a permit just because of, oh, I didn't know the process or I couldn't, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I agree with Mr. Strickland that, you know, something has to be done about the front facade of this building um, and definitely the front. Um, so I, I hold to that. That would be my opinion is that the, the front of this building needs to be treated properly in the way that the local design review commission intended it to be. Um, but I, I do not want to continue to set this precedent of, you know, saying yes to um, people that go forward without permits and then thinking that we're just going to um, say yes. So that, that is my steadfast opinion on this project. Well, just to let you know, I mean, uh, Don, can you explain what happened? I mean, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Did he was I don't think he was aware of this process, was he? The applicant? I I would add, I would let him answer that question. Uh um I mean I don't know if it was COVID related. Uh all I know is that the windows were installed. We we received complaints about the house and and uh we took it through the process and that's that's where we are i don't know i can't explain what the, what the mix up was at the uh window company's end yeah so i'm also talking to that don is i mean us on that universal windows direct we do do i mean we do pull permits um you know according to when we have to um so i mean I'm not going to blame it on COVID in any way, shape, or form. I um, mean, it was our mix up. Um, it was more of the owner of we were, you know, creating their needs and considering he does live um, right around the corner from this property. Um, and he's already done work with us in the past on his home. Um, with that being said, you know, 
us as an organization that has already done work in this neighborhood on his home a few years back, right? Um, that we already were proceeding with his and got it installed and no wrongdoings. And so when we installed this one and, and this is, you know, where we are now. So I do understand the whole permit thing. I mean, we've, we've handled that months ago. Um, so I really don't think we're at that point anymore. Um, it's just more of the fact that I understand this, these front windows, it's just, what would you like us to do with them? Um, so we can get it handled and, you know, continue to move on. Mr. Strickland question. All right. So the doors already new that can remain. It's just the two, the two bay windows in the front. And what about the two, the window above the two bay windows in the front? Is those the three? Yes, yeah. Commissioner Bailey, I, what I'm proposing is that we follow the recommendations of the design review committee completely. So that would be the two attic gable windows be replaced with 50 over 50 with divided lights on top. The two bays be corrected. The four windows on the south and the front entry door needs to go back to a wood door. All right. In the past, we have um, approved of windows on the side since it's not visible. Being yeah, Don asked me that question previously, and I said that I would be certainly willing to accept the vinyl windows on the side. Okay, so I'm just concerned about the front since the ones on the side has already been done. I'm more concerned about just the front and the side just stay as is. Just have the, the front just be a, go back to the original, the doors be wood and the two bays and the window above. Well, I think because of visibility, the design review committee is suggesting that the windows on the side on the south side are so visible that they do impact the aesthetics of the home. And so uh, I would agree with their recommendation that those four windows be replaced as well. Mr. Chair, we have Ms. Anderson, Mr. Santora, and Mr. Tarasik waiting to speak. Ms. Anderson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as far as the windows on the south side that are being replaced, are we talking uh, having to redo all of them or the four windows, the small windows that are probably beside like a fireplace on the inside, uh, um, the small um, square windows? Yes, those. I just want a clarification, first of all, from um, what the local design review committee would like to see. I believe those were the four that they had in mind. Yes. Because that does project out a little bit further. If I remember correctly, that it is visible from the street. I am in support of what the local design review committee would like to see. Um, I, a couple of years ago, we had a, a property on, on Franklin Boulevard where the um, developer put in windows without getting the permits and uh, we disapproved the windows and he did have to replace them with the proper windows. Uh, so I, I think we can be consistent here uh, that uh, we would like to see um, the local design review committee's recommendations fulfilled. And I think it's very important that we do not get another metal door in the front. I think the, the proper wood door without uh, any kind of fan type window 
would be appropriate here. So I am in support of uh, the local design review committee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Santoro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I also agree. I, I, I do feel that the uh, design review committee's comments are appropriate. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, the grills for the windows, I, I noticed in this picture here, if you look on the left, that there are other adjacent properties that don't necessarily have it. And while there were original ones uh, in the pictures that were shown, I can understand that the um, the homeowner and the applicant feel that it is a cleaner look. I, I don't think that's too much of a loss there. But for the, the uh, divination of the windows in that main portion on the front, I understand that you may feel that it presents a cleaner look, but um, in all honesty, when I'm looking at it, I feel that the breakup of those that large window pane um, actually helps scale down what looks to be a pretty large bump out on that front facade and would be integral to the aesthetics on the front there. So I I would feel that um, breaking it up like the committee suggested would be the best course of action, uh, especially as we're looking at the front. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Teresa, did you have a comment to make? Yes, please. Uh, first, thank you. Uh, First of all, I, I'd like to uh, to uh, to commend the applicant actually for their candor uh, in in this process and not. I mean, so many things have have been very difficult procedurally uh, in in various aspects of our lives because of COVID. And I guess I want to uh, want to uh, I appreciate the candor uh, with the applicant and in indicating that how we got here with this project. Um, I would agree with with my my fellow colleagues here on the, on on the commission. Uh, with respect to uh, to accepting the design uh, reviews uh, comments, and in, in, in the few years that I have been on this commission, uh, I may be wrong, and, and I do. Uh, before I say that, I think we 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 are always careful uh, and are cautious about using the word precedent uh, on this uh, uh, on this commission. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, I think in the few years that I have been here, I cannot recall that we have ever approved vinyl windows on the on the front of, of, of any structure. Uh, so uh, I, I will, uh, uh, I am in agreement with the, my, my colleagues here on the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on the commission? Mr. Chair, there are no additional hands raised at this time. So we do have a motion on the table. Well, I'll make a motion, John Carlo, and that is that we reject the applicant's request to improve the installation as installed without permits and further condition that the uh, applicant follow specifically the recommendations of the design review committee in rectifying this installation. Are you also suggesting uh, if we did go back to the design review committee and they worked out the proposal that they agreed to, that then we would ac accept the suggestion from the design review committee, or would, do we need to review this again? No, I, if um, the applicant agrees to follow specifically the recommendations of the design review committee, that I'd be willing to accept the vinyl windows and the balance of the house for the accept of the four windows on the south side and then okay. replacing the windows in the front and the door. Okay. And then it would just be submitted to staff for approval. Very good. Thank you. Uh, can, I a make a, can I make a comment? Uh, sure. uh, Don, this question is for you. Um, we already paid for this, correct? That's correct. And the photograph that we're looking for, the applicant came to us, and it's the one at the bottom with the um, changes they already made. And the motion is that we reject what was presented to us. So the question for you is, 
we all, the, the applicant already heard what everybody wanted is to follow what the local design would do. Can we table this and ask the applicant to come back to us with the new design on what the applicant want and we vote on that new design without voting on this? Can that happen? Uh, we could, but that's not the motion on the table. Uh, yes. And I, and I think. I, I think we, we, okay. we either we can table it, but I, there's a motion on the table. We have to act on. Did someone make a 2nd already? We do not have a 2nd yet. I will 2nd the motion. I am happy with the. Um, applicant working with the local design review committee to put the proper windows in the uh, in the on the property and uh, that. Um, design being approved by staff. I mean, if you want to approve by staff, that's fine. Then that way it don't have to come back to us. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I think we should call for a vote. Donald, Mr. Please. Chair, Mr. Santoro has his hand raised. Mr. Santoro, please. Yes, just um, I had one one question. Uh, and this is for Don on the process. So it's my understanding that they've replaced all the windows in this house. A denial here, what would that necessarily do? Because we are only asking them to replace specific windows. Uh, would that would they still be allowed to um, basically get their permit for the remaining windows and then have to resubmit uh, for the ones being requested? No, we could, we could, we could approve an amended permit application for just the sides and the rear windows. Uh, but it would be with the condition that they have to address, you know, the, the, the windows that have been disapproved today by the commission. Understood. Thank yeah. you. Which You're is, welcome. Yeah, but what the motion I think is stating. Yeah, Don, that's as a clarification, my motion does specifically state. stated acceptance of the windows on the balance of the house. Under understood. And that would also include the acceptance of the steel doors at the side and the rear, I believe there was, but not on the front. Yes. Correct. Mr. Patton, would you call for both, please? Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Or Ms. I, Daly. We're voting, we're voting no, or are we voting? <laughs> we're voting this yes to the motion. Is, it's a motion to disapprove. <laughs> Okay, all right. The motion to disapprove, I am voting yes. Thank you. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Clickia. Yes. Mr. Santora. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, we can move. Mr. Forward. Chair, if I may, for a second, uh, Josh, get in contact with myself or Mr. Pettit, and we can guide you through your next steps on what to do for uh, your permit application to be corrected. All right. Thank you so much, Carl. I appreciate it. Sure. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry for the interruption. Welcome. That's okay. All right, let's move forward to case number 21-027, Ohio City Historic District Concept Plan. For the Yasaki residents at the West 38th Street. Please go ahead with the presentation. Uh, so, my name is Greg Ernst. I'm the architect for the project. Also joining me is Sean Yasaki, the client. Um, the main differences between what the board, the commission saw last time um, is strictly dealing with the design of the facade. If you want to jump to the renderings, nothing really changed in plan per se. Um, we looked at reducing the height of the overall house slightly. Um, some of the other items that we looked at was uh, shrinking the width of the eave that projects out 
from the from the house uh, that was at 36 inches. We reduced that to 24 inches to try and reduce the overall massing. We also looked at um, raising what is the bottom of the roof, even though it's the vertical roof portion. We raised that up a little bit just to break down the scale um, for the neighbors. And then finally, the most important thing that we did was just looked at changing the colors. It was a pretty stark black and a much lighter wood on the front facade. We changed that to be uh, somewhat more of a, a charcoal gray, a little bit lighter gray that you can see in the renderings, and then also changed the wood color to help blend into the neighborhood a little bit more. Um, that was one of the main comments from the commission last time. So the the main goals here is just kind of blend it in with the two-story brick uh, multifamily building to the left side there. Um, and um, just as a reminder to the commission for the rest of this neighborhood, especially the spur or this portion of West 38th, there is um, a, a varying degree of uh, house and building types between brick and uh, siding. Uh, scales are, are pretty wildly different across the street. There is a large three-story multifamily house uh, or structure, and then there's a one-story industrial building with a garage door facing the street, and then there's a park. Um, so there's a varying level of um, structures on the street, and we, we feel like we have uh, reduced the presence of the house on the street just to try and blend in more with the neighbors. So that's the main changes from the last time that this was seen during concept plan. And um, that, that's basically our our changes at this point. OK, thank you. Um, do we have a representative from the design local design committee? Mr. Chair, Ms. Grigonis Bailey was not able to stay in the meeting, but she has given me some extensive comments to read for the okay. design review committee. Um, this project came to the committee two different times, and all the committee members were consistent in their comments related to the project both times. From the conceptual plan, second. The committee was recommending horizontal, or horizontal siding rather than vertical as presented. They were also not in favor of the curb cut on the north of the parcel when there's an existing curb cut to the south. In the most recent iteration, the color palette was changed by the design team and owners in order to blend in with the neighborhood more, and this was appreciated by the committee, but they stated that this was not an issue to begin with. Um, they felt that they did not address any of the major concerns that the committee had. It needs to be have more relation to the context of the neighborhood. The nature of the powerful roof line and shape and how it wraps into the building are not contextual in the area. Uh, as the form and the massing were not changed from the first time that it was seen, and again, not contextual. Um, Okay. Hang on, so I've got some more here. Uh, it said that it reads more like a single family townhouse rather than a single family home. Um, it's clear in the Secretary of Standards that new infill construction should be subordinate to the historic district. Uh, the de a detached garage would go a long way to alleviating the issues that have been mentioned. Um, the committee is asking for more elevations in context. To the to the neighborhood to better gauge the height issues. Uh, it's the most difficult thing was the roof line that they were having a problem with. Um, and then so the the recommendation of the design review committee it was the rec committee unanimously disapproved of design as presented. So the roof line throws off the balance of the home. Must make an effort to soften the roof line. Height and massing does not match predominant form in the direct neighborhood. This proposal reads more like a single family townhome than a single family house. The proposal goes against the Secretary of the Interior Standards as new infill construction should be subordinate to the historic district where the massing and the height of this roof are against that standard. Thank you. Ah. 
that's a considerable amount of suggestions. Um, any comments from the committee? I can't see whose hand is raised, I'm sorry. Mr. Santora has his hand raised. Please, Mr. Santora, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I have um, one question for Don and Carl um, and for the applicant. Is there any photos? I know Carl was going through the slides. I don't believe I saw any that show us images of the surrounding buildings. I recall seeing this uh, for conceptual um, comment a few meetings ago, and I can't recall if there were uh, pictures then, but we're, we're only seeing a couple buildings really to two adjacent on what they look like. Um, and really, I would like to see this building in context of not only the buildings directly adjacent, but the corner and across the street. Um, for the design, I think the design is very fairly nice, like I stated at the last meeting. Um, I, I do agree that I would like to see the curb cut gone, but understanding that, you know, it is, it is a single family residence. And if you can go to the site plan, Carl, it does look like they address the comment about making sure to do the study of uh, turning radiuses into the parking uh, garage in the rear. So th that would be my question. Is there anything that really shows us in the context to see if it is appropriate? Um, from what it's showing here, I, I like the design of it, but I'd like to see it in context a little bit more. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Ms. Anderson and Mr. Strickland have their hands raised. Um, Ms. Anderson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am pretty supportive of most of what the local design review committee uh, its feedback is on this project. Um, I agree that uh, the um, overall design it is very bold and it's very um it's innovative but it is really out of um, is so inconsistent with the um, nature of the um, architecture in that immediate area that i think it's just going to stand out especially when that tree does not have leaves on it it's it's going to be kind of in your face and um the, the um, new construction has to demure to the uh, overall character of the designs that are ex already existing in the district. Um, so I, I agree with them. I think that this building, it just, if it was south of Lorraine or in, um, in Tremont, I think it would work very well. But I don't think it works for the historic district. I disagree in that I understand the need for that additional curb cut in the driveway. Um, the um, family has small children, and I think they need a dedicated driveway of their own. So on that aspect, I, I disagree. But uh, otherwise, I am uh, consistent with the uh, uh, determination of the local design review committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Strickland, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Greg, do you have context photos as part of this presentation today? Um, I actually raised my hand for that reason. Is there, is it possible for me to share my screen or for Carl to bring up Google Maps, Street View or anything? I am not able to do that. Okay. Sorry. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, last, I, Greg, in the last presentation, I think you had some context photos, but that's not available today. Um, I, I essentially submitted the same package just with updated rendering. So uh, I don't recall that from last time, but. So there, I, I can't share anything. Carl, Carl what's in the um, deck? Have you shown me? I, I can, I cannot get out of this presentation it's, it should have been as a part of the presentation with the surrounding um context and such but i can't stop sharing the screen yeah okay 
All right. Well, that's unfortunate. But uh, so I'll just comment that, you know, I I like the design very much. And, um, you know, there's several instances throughout Ohio City, Tremont, Gordon Square of more contemporary, modern designs infilling with uh, amongst historic residences. And I think it just adds to the diversity and complexity of the neighborhood. So uh, I understand it. It certainly sticks out, but um, I'm in favor of it. I like the design. Well, so if I would be in favor of it. Thank you. If if I could just speak to kind of the context a little bit, um, you, you, you do see the two story brick building, obviously, to the south, the one story uh, vinyl sided house to the north. Um, just north of that's a two story, very thin uh, brick building as well. I, I, and I mentioned across the street is a very tall three story multifamily sided house and then a purple brick painted uh, industrial building one story north of that and then a park. So the, the challenge we have is is what context are we trying to fit within given the fact that there are literally seven or eight different types of buildings, materials, everything in this one stretch of West 38th. Um, and just north of that is the school, the three story brick school. So, um, you know, if it's if it's to make it fit in with the one and a half story house because that's directly next door or to the brick that's just to the south or uh, you know the purple painted brick across the street it's it gets kind of difficult to determine which we're supposed to be plucking our um, uh, context context from so thank you any other comments from the committee uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Yusaki has his hand raised, then Ms. Please, Bailey Mr. and Mr. Benezzi. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, just a comment on the height context on the block of between Woodbine and Franklin. So just on 38th, that small section, uh, this is the fourth tallest structure with the uh, large three story, I believe it's a multi unit home on the corner of Woodbine and 38th. The school is larger, and then at 38th and Franklin, it's that large kind of manor mansion complex, uh, which is also taller than this project. Thank you. Any other comments? As I mentioned in the last meeting, um, I like the structure of this um, building. Different and it's um, unique. Thank you. We have Mr. Benezzi uh, next. Any other comments? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to speak to appropriateness and this idea of appropriateness, and I, and I think Mr. And fellow member Strickland touched on it, and it is unfortunate that in the presentation wasn't the um, context because I, I did pull up Google Maps on, on my own to see what this area looks like. And it's if, if we were talking about the center of Ohio City and, and in, in the thoroughfares of these kind of courts and, and very regimented historical buildings, I, I would argue it's not appropriate. Um, but given the context and, and every building has its own context and its own place, um, th this corner and this specific corner lends itself to, you know, a, a building that is different. And I trust me, I'm Mr. Modern. So, but I have to speak to what is appropriate. And I and I think it is appropriate in its current condition, because you have a a jumbled typology on this corner of of a park, as you said, an industrial building. Um, not even what looks to be about 200 feet up the road is a nearly five story structure. So. Um, what's appropriate in this part of Ohio City, I think, is, is, you know, completely thrown out the book of, you know, say what the design review committee came back with their comments. Um, and, and I would argue that, that the building is attempting to be appropriate. It's pulling material conditions from its fellow neighbor on the one end 
It's borrowing from roof profiles that are reminiscent of the building that is north of it, but kind of augmenting them in this new contemporary condition. Um, so I would argue that the building is appropriate where it stands because it's it's not, you know, flat out saying like, you know, I'm going to be a flat roofed building and I'm going to be, you know, this all townhouse. Um, and, and I commend the architect for, for, for navigating the sensibility in this kind of very, very difficult site in Ohio City, which is this infill position. So, um, although I, I understand where the design review, the local design review was coming from, um, I, I think in accepting its appropriateness and thinking about, you know, how does it fit on this corner in this neighborhood of Ohio City, I, I would argue that uh, it, it would read as appropriate. And, and overall, I think it's a very well done design. So um, that's my opinion and my comments. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Any other comments from the committee? Mr. Chair, Ms. Anderson has her hand raised. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am still not convinced that this design would work in this in this location of the historic district. Uh, the roof uh, uh, configuration is like nothing else in this area. Um, the uh, facade being recessed from the uh, let's say the envelope of the um, uh, 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 sides and uh, roof. Again, that's not something that's uh, seen in the historic district. Uh, the lack of symmetry with the, the openings, the like the windows, the doors. Again, there's usually a more of a deference to symmetry with the historic buildings and also the vertical siding is something that is not consistent with uh, what is um, already uh, given to us by the uh, historic uh, nature and character of the um, the area. So again, I, I uh, as support with the design review uh, local committee has uh, uh, said, and I am not going to be able to support this project. Thank you. I would like to make some comments at this point. Um, as much as I would like don't like to disagree with my dear friend and colleague, uh, Michelle Anderson. Uh, I think this is a really interesting, bold design, and I think uh, um, it's kind of refreshing to see something new and bold in a neighborhood and, you know, um, trying to blend in the, in the local neighborhood is obviously, you know, maybe one of the missions of of architecture in an historical neighborhood. But I also think we have to look to the future and create something bold and different. Uh, I, if I had an objection to this, it would be again that color. Um, I'm just getting a little tired of these dark of the dark. I think that wood facade is interesting, the hanging garden. Um, so overall I think uh, I can approve this um, project. As far as the local committee is concerned, the design committee is concerned, I think their comments really um, are not very grounded. I'm not sure really what they're objecting to, that the entire design, I'm not sure that they have the authority to be design consultants. Uh, so I'm not quite sure really what, what, um, what specific items are they objecting to? And do we need to go back to the committee for their approval? And I'm not sure we need to do that as well. I think we have, you know, the authority to uh, decide uh, ourselves without going back to the local design committee. Any comments on that, Donald? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the applicant has the right to come to the commission over the design reviews objections. Okay. So I don't think it should go back. I think it's up to the commission to make a decision. Very good. Then I will ask for a motion. I'll make a motion. I move approval um, as designed as presented um, that the owner 
and the um, architect um, take a look at the um, the curb cut and the radius with the staff, um, and also uh, present with the staff the contents um, of the neighborhood, the building heights, and you know show the staff the information around the you know the eight neighborhood, the height, the various existing condition, and if possible. Trying to work with the staff to see if you can reduce that width height of the um, the, the um, building uh, that you're presenting. Everything looks great. I like the um, presenter, so that's why I said move as uh, approved as presented. But just work with still work with staff on it to see if you can kind of lower the height. But just show the contents of the neighborhood. You, you didn't have that information. Show that with the staff and work with the radius and the curb cut um, with staff. That's my motion. Well, how would you suggest lowering the height? I, I didn't hear you. How would you suggest lowering the height? Yeah. Well, just work with the staff, get the height up, but they need to show the contents of what's in the neighborhood and see how much they can lower down. So the staff need to see what's around the neighborhood to determine what needs to get lower, how much. Well, they, mentioned, they, they already mentioned that there's other higher structures around there. So staff needs to see what's the contents around there. And then that can determine what needs to get lower. Okay, doesn't it have, to have, it, have that information already? Like the height of this building. Is the uh, still Commissioner Bailey, I'm sorry, uh, John Carlo yeah? was suggesting that the height doesn't need to be reduced. Oh, and okay. I agree that it doesn't. Need no, I don't think the height needs to get reduced, but I just want them to show the information that was not able to show in the presentation because they didn't have that information they still need to show that to staff it, we we can absolutely do that um i just want to clarify just something about the height it is three stories we we are eight foot ceilings on all three floors uh, yeah I'm, we're pretty much fixed on the height but we can definitely show that there are taller buildings on this small part of west 38 that are taller than this house yes and, yes. and uh, Greg, you don't need a height variance for this. Right? No, we're under 35 feet. Exactly. Okay. So I'm not even asking you to reduce anything. Just share the information with staff. Okay. okay. Very good. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that motion. Thank you very much. So, Zano, can we call for a vote then? Ms. Anderson. No. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bonesi. Yes. Mr. Calicchia. Yes. Mr. Santora. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Tarasic. Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion passes. Very good. Seven to one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. So, um, I guess the next step is to move forward with the concept plan for um, Little Italy Historic District at uh, 1934 East 133rd Street. Do we have a presentation, please? Yes, okay, let's go ahead. <laughs> Hello, uh, uh, Ryan, is Ryan there? Yeah, I'm here, I'm sorry. Yeah, if I didn't want to steal your thunder. Um, hello, everyone, <laughs> I'm Andrew Kalnitsky, I'm with Gold Key Builders. Um, we will be the developer builder for this project. And we also have Ryan Grass, who's with uh, Grassroots Architect, uh, who will be presenting for you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I've been here for 
three hours, I stepped away to make one last cup of coffee for the day. And it was, of course, when you put me on the agenda. Um, I apologize. So, hi there. I'm Ryan Grass with uh, Grassroots Architecture. And uh, um, Andrew and I are proposing to generally, and with your approval, conceptual design at this phase, but our end goal is to take down a house in a garage and a small garden wall and then replace it with five beautiful three-story townhouses configured into two buildings on 123rd Street. Um, we're excited the prospect of uh, working in Little Italy and um, I haven't been work I've worked that neighborhood for a number of years so it's exciting to get back and in front of you now in the presentation you see kind of the aerial views of the neighborhood and the property we've outlined the property itself and uh, what I'll call the suspect home at this time mm -hmm. and then you'll also see the street views and I take liberties with the word suspect the home the current owner uh, at one point had decided to do some roof renovations had part of the roof demoed and then stopped so this has been a little bit of time a couple of years I understand so you can imagine a, the condition of a home with the uh, part of the roof removed in Ohio in Cleveland specifically that takes some weather damage on the outside and the inside so that's why we respectfully asked for the demolition the buildings are essentially a wreck so um yeah if you could I don't know who's in charge of the slides oh thank you Ooh, boom there it is <laughs> there it is that's uh that's our proposal that's a street view at 123rd if you will to the right is uh, a little context the the right in this image is north to the north is a two-story eight unit apartment building um and to the left is a two-story single family home um the you can see our is is our proposed building is positioned to the north of our property and uh i'll start by how we cited the building itself so between the building on your right and our building if it's positioned here is their driveway and then to the south of ours left is our driveway and then the house to the south and then their driveway so what we've how we decided it's positioning is if we position on the south side of the property everybody still gets their driveway but we are right against an existing building we didn't think that was appropriate so by putting it on the north side of our property it offers you know the 10 feet of space between us and the adjacent property for them to maintain the current driveway that they have and also afford us a driveway. And it's nice that all the properties, all the new townhouses will kind of face um, Little Italy proper. And uh, we think that's uh, appropriate. Um, this is the south elevation. So this faces, if you were if you were standing on that single family home to the south, this is what you'd see. It's uh, three townhouse units configured into a single building on the right, and East 23rd is to the right in this image. And yeah. to the left is a three-story, two-unit building. There's a driveway that runs the length of the property and a sidewalk between the driveway and the houses. And a, and the spot between is uh, a, some visitor parking and a place to put some snow once uh, when we need some plowing. But you're, you're starting to kind of see the configuration of the units, if you will. First floor is stair entry area mechanical room second floor is living dining kitchen and a balcony and the third floor is two bedrooms two bathrooms and on occasion a balcony not every unit has a, a third story balcony but we put those where they were appropriate so for example there's a third balcony and a porch on the one that faces 123rd there's an extra balcony on the two that face the open area between the buildings and one to the rear uh, and you can start to see the materiality of the project. Um, it has a brick base, garden wall at the front porch, if you will, and um, around much of the building, although it's not all of it. And we're proposing on the bays, uh, probably five painted fiber cement on the front unit that faces 123rd that you see uh, to kind of the bottom right. Um, again, that's lap siding fiber cement. And let me back up the bays that you see I, I think we imagine those as fiber cement panels and not siding so large panels with battens or reveals or some sort of pattern uh 
system to manufacture that and then lap side on the front building we'd like to do vinyl side, lap side on the balance of the building um that's not visible um from the street and again this is just another view of uh, kind of aerial from the uh this is the southwest if you will you can start to see the single family homes to the right And another, this is from the northeast. If you'll see the apartment building on the right, the single family homes on the left. And you can start to see, you know, a smattering of landscaping on the front and uh, the configuration of windows. This is, if we can call this the utilitarian side, this faces the apartment building to the right. Um, the, the building is pretty close to the property line. So we are, because of that, we're limited to uh, the amount of glazing we can put on that. Um, based on code, we can't open up all of it, as you, if you will. And uh, there's also some kind of stair top. There's bathrooms and uh, um, kitchens on this side as well. So if you could, if you will, the bottom window is the garage. The second floor window is in the kitchen above the sink, and the third floor window is in a in the second bedroom. And this is the very this faces the west, faces the um, on the adjacent property to the west that faces the next street are uh, i think there's two small let's say six or eight unit apartment buildings the rest are two-story single family homes um, and this will face that direction at least the backs of their properties um here is the uh the site plan 123rd is oriented to your far right north is up in this drawing so you'll see the first floor plan of the units and uh, the, the proposed site plan um, working kind of right to left. You see there's a sidewalk, there's a, there's a porch. Um, let's, uh, it's not at grade, it's about two foot above the sidewalk level. And, um, and then you'll start the first three units, two parking spaces for uh, visitors or additional um, uh, cars and then the last two units in the last building on the far left you and here you start to see where this is a challenging site it's 40 feet wide that's it so we've got to drive and then we've also got to be able to orient cars to get into their garages so the challenge that andrew and i faced and i think we successfully resolved was we've made a car and a half wide garage so kind of the maneuvering of being able to back out and turn into the drive and then orient yourself toward the street. I, I think we've solved that with a larger garage so people can begin to make those adjustments with their driving, um, partly in the garage before the exit into the, uh, into the proper, into the drive proper. <clears throat> and the subsequent plans are just the upper levels. So you can start to see how it works out where there's the balconies in the living room, kitchens, dining rooms in these units. Um, and on the upper floor, the uh, it's the two bathrooms and two bedrooms. One's configured as a master suite where it's an internal bathroom, ensuite, if you will, and the uh, secondary bedroom has a common uh, common rest or open restroom, if you will. Oh, some enlarged plans, what I just kind of went over. And I, I believe that <clears throat> completes the documents that we offered. At the risk of offering you another dark gray building, I understand that's been a subject of discussion today. Uh, we, we, did, we were proposing a, a, a dark, rich color on uh, the street facade of this building. So if there's any questions, um, Andrew and I are happy to answer them. Comments? Mr. Chair, Mr. Pettit has his hand raised. Mr. Pettit, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to offer some context and history here. Uh, and we should look at the site visits photos for the demolition. Uh, this property has been through a long process. Uh, we visited the site a couple of years ago, 
And as you can see from the images, uh, this house, this existing house is worse than a wreck, uh, it, mostly because of the roof condition, but also because of a number of inappropriate alterations over the years. Uh, there's some structural issues. I don't think the house was very significant to begin with. Uh, we've really been holding off on the demolition, uh, you know, waiting for a decent, acceptable proposal for the site to replace it. And we think this is this is getting close. Uh, but as you can see, uh, you know, the interior is nothing special. Uh, it's got real issues. Under different circumstances, it would probably have to come down uh, as, a, as a public nuisance. Uh, uh, we did a site visit. I don't remember if any of the commission members attended, uh, but I know the design review committee was there. Uh, I don't know, Carl, if you want to add add anything to that. I believe this building, the original building was at um, 1897. And the subsequent, you can see here, you can actually see where they went into the front of the building because it has the original siding in there. Um, roof is open. It's had, I think, three additions, three or four different additions. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a wreck, as you can see. Uh, this this proposal has been to the Little Italy Design Review Committee. Uh, they support it. Uh, they have no issue with the demolition. They think the building should come down. Uh, their concerns are with the number of units in the project and also that the uh, access to the adjoining properties be maintained. That, that's, that's a major issue uh, because it, it is a difficult property to cite, but uh, they, they generally support the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. A quick comment, if I may. Originally, what we presented to Little Italy Design Review was a six unit project. Um, and then after addressing their comments, we turned into a five unit project. So we've listened to their comments and revised it. I, I guess uh, my comment is, is that driveway, a common driveway, the road that leads to the uh, town to the new construction. Yes, it's a regular city street. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, it's a, it's a private drive. Designated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Thank common you. to all the units. Yeah. Yes. All right. All right. Well, our Mr. Chair. Yes. We have uh, a Mary Fatica Martin from the public who would like to make a comment. Okay. Please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm getting myself situated here with the technology. Thank you to the commission and to the architects for this contribution to the neighborhood for a blighted property. You're absolutely correct. It does need to come down. Um, no one's going to spend the money to try to renovate that property. And um, the historical value has already um, been bastardized. I live five doors away from here. Mm -hmm. I've watched a four unit condominium go up across the street two years ago. That was on two parcels of land that were combined with the variance to build these four condos. Now, my question is, what is the square footage of each of these condominiums? Hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, I kind of fit, Ryan, I, I did a quick math just oh, looking at our conceptual plan. Um, they're about 1,250, they're, or just under 1,300, I would say, between 1,250 and 1,300, somewhere in there. Okay, and how many bedrooms are there in each one? They're each one of them, they're pretty similar, um, other than the balconies. Um, it's a two bedroom, two and a half bathroom. So basically, it's a two bedrooms are on the upper level. And there are two bathrooms in the upper level, and then there's a powder room on the main floor. Okay, 
And what is the purchase price for the townhomes? Well, obviously, as a design review it is ongoing and the design changes, the price also fluctuates. But at this point, it will be way under 400, maybe even 350. Okay. And are, will you be seeking a tax abatement for the owners? Yes, I think that's um, we're very thankful for for that program that the city of Cleveland is offering. So, and we'd like to take advantage of it if if we can. Yes. Okay, so then that is my concern. I represent a small business owner on the street. The majority of the houses on this street are multiple dwellings. The one that you're taking down was not. It was a family home, and as a result of the four condominiums that were built on two parcels of land two years ago and approved by landmarks and by the city and provided a tax abatement. This small business owner that I represent had their taxes doubled. Now, I have a concern about this because what's happening here is the majority of the buildings in historic Little Italy are multiple dwellings. And if this tax abatement continues and we're stressing the owners of the landmark buildings in a landmark district with increasing taxes because of the new development coming in, it will be difficult for those small business owners to number one, maintain and preserve the buildings in the historic district. And number two, it will be difficult then for them to be competitive. So I think what we're creating here, and I ask the landmarks to think about the environment that we're creating here from a mindset on developers and the preservation of historic districts. What are you really creating here when you are doing this to the people that are trying to preserve the properties with the landmark district and making it difficult for the small business owners to compete with the new development. So uh, those are my comments. I, I put that out on the table for consideration. If, if in, in reality, the landmarks is there to protect and preserve the property owners. We are property owners. We are small business owners and we live in the district. So I, I ask you to protect our interest as small business owners in the area and to think about how justified is it to put five condominiums on one parcel of land and then stress financially the surrounding people that are trying to upgrade and compete with that? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Yes. Trott is back in the meeting. Okay. Um, and also, I have some yeah. more information on design considerations. I sent uh, this project over to Kyle Reese and he responded uh, with townhouse code recommendations. So I'm going to okay. read what his okay. email was. Um, sure. He's been meeting with the developers of the project and he's gone over the townhouse code and they've made changes to this. Um, they're not quite who in compliance with the townhouse code. Um, the unit facing the street will need to have its first floor active space depth increased. Although they are meeting the nine foot depth, it is required to be nine foot clear for active space. The way it is designed now it is not actually active space. The intent of that requirement was to have at least a bonus room on the first floor that can be used as an office, rec room, et cetera. They also cannot have stairs on the outside wall. They need a minimum of 30 square feet of glazing on the street facing unit. Um, full width and depth of the ground floor porch should be covered by a roof. Moving the stair to an interior wall will allow them to get rid of the square window between the first and second floor. And by doing that, they can fully cover the first floor porch with the balcony. They may need to add columns to do so, but full porches are an important part of Little Italy street culture and the new unit should have them too. 
They will need a street screen between the street facing unit and the driveway. He recommends placing it at the back edge of the landscaping nearest to the garage door. Not yet adopted, but working its way through the um, city planning process is a change to the driveway paving material requirements in the town <coughs> code. Because this proposal has garage doors that are visible from the sidewalk, they would be required to, under the new changes, to have at least 60% of the surface area of the auto court paved with human scaled materials. This could be brick, pavers, or similar. This. Um, Another change that is coming is a requirement for landscaping in the auto carts when the garage doors are visible from the street. This is in combination with the paving material is intended to soften and enliven a traditionally dead space. This is good for residents too, but is actually intended to reduce the burden on pedestrians walking past it on the sidewalk from having it look like a dead impervious space. Based upon the specs from the new code, they would be required to have a total of 75 square feet of landscaping in the auto court. They can break that up any way they choose. Uh, those are the comments that were given to me by Mr. Reese. I show that Mr. Pettit and Mr. Santora have their hands raised. Thank you, Mr. Pettit, please. So is Julie back? I am Julie, back. Julie, okay. Julie is back and I'm lowering my hand. Okay, and then Mr. Santora and Julie, you can take over if you like. Thank you for coming back. Absolutely. Mr. Santoro. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a lot of my comments were addressed in the letter that uh, Kyle read, uh, sorry, Carl read from Kyle to many K's here. Um, but I did have some additional comments. Carl, can you go to the site plan, please? Um, you know, has the applicant really investigated the um, the turning requirements and um, vehicular requirements for this drive, uh, because as I'm looking at this and understanding that, you know, the front doors face out onto this um, this vehicular drive, and we do want to make sure that it feels like uh, a pedestrian space. So obviously, you're going to want buffering materials, and like Kyle stated in his remarks, you know, there are going to be requirements for. Um, uh, pedestrian scale materiality for the paving as well as landscaping and looking at this I'm not sure how you would be able to operate those vehicles in that space so have you has the applicant really explored the the approach to the utilization of these garages yes in a if I could if I could call it non-traditional um, my uh, my daughter and I have chalked out the drive and the size of the garages and the approach areas and the restrictions that are currently shown on it for with stoops and so forth. And um, confident we can, can we can maneuver the automobiles in and out of these spaces. So um, to that degree, yes. And and I'd also um, just like to comment that the, everything that. Uh, Carl read from Kyle, and that's being that's being brought up now. Wonderfully valid points, and and it is not our intention to circumvent any of these standards. Uh, we just wanted to be able to get the concept in front and get the discussion started with uh, this commission. So as we kind of move forward, we're we're uh, we can do that with some confidence when we make some additional changes. Mm -hmm. So that's a long way to get to. Um, can we get cars in and out of here with uh, without trouble? That I have a, a great deal of confidence in. And will we address the the townhouse code requirements from the city of Cleveland? Absolutely. Um, currently, we're not intending on circumventing them or even asking for variances. Our goal is to um, pick as few battles as we have to moving forward, and uh, and each step confirm that everything still works while we fold in these requirements. Is, is that a helpful answer? That That is very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, and you, yeah, I, I was going to ask for clarification and just for reassurance that this is conceptual only, so we're not making any vote or anything today. Um, okay. Just providing some comment, uh, comments, so right. thank you for that. Um, the other thing, uh, my last comment would be, 
Uh, Carl, can you go to, I believe it's the first slide, which shows the kind of axon of the existing building. Um, I have no issues with the demolition of the building. I do believe that um, it's shown through the, uh, keep going, Carl. Oh, the very first? Yeah, the very first that shows the existing kind of, so, yeah. Oh, right there. Um, so in, in looking at this, you know, I, I don't have any issue with the demolition of the building, like I was saying. I think it's been very well shown that uh, the building has a lot of structural issues, uh, and I don't think there would be too much uh, loss. Um, I do ask that uh, either staff or the applicant, preferably the applicant, because it is your duty upon looking at a demolition, kind of really get into and see if there is any historical um, uh, historical events that happened here. I doubt there is, but um, you know it is part of what we are required to look at for it. So just make sure you do due do, do diligence on that. Uh, and then also, can you guys speak a little bit to the three-story height you're proposing? I'm looking here, and it seems like on both sides of the street, it is two stories, um, and it seemed when you're showing it in the very small context when you modeled out some of the adjacent buildings to be uh, you know, a full story taller than what's proposed. And I would really encourage you guys, and we've seen this with the uh, projects that we had earlier today, to really make sure that when you're looking at the heights of these buildings, you are looking them in context of not just the few adjacent buildings, but really the entirety of the street, both on your side of the street and the other side of the street. Um, so can you guys talk to the reason you guys decided for that height and how you feel it's appropriate? Sure. Um, uh, it, the, the frankest answer is um, three star, three story townhouses just kind of lay out great. And uh, just as, as a concept for our building standing alone, three stories is appropriate. The, the two adjacent buildings, and really, if, you, if you're staring at the front of our building, three buildings to the left are all about the same as the one that we showed um, in our context. There are two stories. Um, I think I wrote it down here. They're, they're, about 20, they're, they're about 20 feet to the top of their second floor and 28 to 30 feet to the peak of their roof which is frankly 30 feet is to the the bottom edge of our roof mm -hmm. we're at 28 to 30 feet depending on where you're at in the building um so yeah we're, we're significantly taller the one to the right uh the shorter flat roof building is uh just under 24 feet um but if you move kind of further south on the street past those three that we show in the, or the couple that we show in those street images we immediately get to a uh, two and a half to three story building and then the new townhouse that uh, I, I apologize the, the resident's name. I don't remember her name. Um, I think the townhouses that she's talking about, those are three stories. The building just adjacent, adjacent to that are three stories. So are we taller and bigger? Are we taller than most? Yes. Are we appropriate? And, and that's subjective. I'm going to say yes as well. And and as we move forward, I think we'll start to offer you um, more more context imagery as our building gets refined. Hopefully yep. to address that. All right. Well, then I would also recommend that you you continue to push forward on options that bring the scale down at least on the front um, to Fair. make it a little bit more in line with those uh, adjacent buildings in the surrounding area. Uh, I like the form. I, I like the inclusion of the gables. I would like to see a little bit different colors. You know, it was mentioned the darker color palette we always see for buildings. <laughs> so explore, explore a little bit on the colors. Uh, and other than that, I think it's a pretty good project. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Centora. Uh, since I'm coming a little bit late, I don't know if there's others uh, who have questions or comments on the project. Since I haven't seen the full presentations, I'm going to refrain, refrain from giving comments myself. No other questions or comments from the commission? Mr. Bonazzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Carl, if we could go a few pages. I want to see the um, south facing, oh, this one. Um, overall, I am really um, excited 
to, as the way that uh, it, the project is going. I'm glad you guys are embracing the gable shape to fit in with the neighborhood. And as prior comments said, the color <laughs> color is not um, the friend today. Um, but the one thing I would ask you to, to explore is just the um, the way that these these gables are intersecting. I think when the one gable is independent in this elevation, it reads really well and contextual. But the the odyssey of two gables perfectly symmetrical, just kind of glued together. Um, I would I would just say take some time and maybe go around the neighborhood and see different ways that, that the that gables are intersected or overlapped or kind of lay, and that could kind of add to the contextualization of the the form to the neighborhood. But um, overall, and then the, the new additions to the townhouse code, which I I kind of had a feeling were going to affect this project. Um, but other than that, I'm excited to see how this progresses. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Anderson? Thank Ms. you, Madam Ms. Chair. Uh, clearly, the building that's there has to come down. It's really a, a disaster and probably a hazard to the community at this point. Um, you know, I I don't feel that this body can speak on tax abatement, that we're not the venue um, to address uh, residential tax abatement policy in the city. Um, you know, overall, I, I like the designs. I feel like they're, it's a site that probably would be great for four units. I think five is kind of, it's really squeezing them in there. Um, but you know, overall, I you know I like the gabled roofs. Uh, I like the balconies. Um, you know, I realize they the property is on the market for two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, and you know, and then you're going to have to undertake the demolition costs to go from there. So, so the numbers may not work at a you know um, with a smaller configuration of units, but I. I <coughs> I think the, the site will get better with a smaller configuration. So those are my comments. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Strickland? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I heard from the comments from the uh, local design review committee that they wanted to make sure that access to the uh, adjacent or adjoining properties was maintained and I didn't understand what the concern was looking at the site plan. Site plan, can you explain that? Oh, sure. That's a great question. If if I could see the, the kind of proposed site plan, if you will. <coughs> thanks. Um, thanks very much. So it, it it starts with at the at the far east end of the property. Um, if I can draw your attention to that the 10 foot kind of setback dimension, that's that northeast corner of the property. Uh -huh. the the building to our north only has about eight feet between the edge of their building and our property just about an, about one foot eight inches of their driveway is on our property mm -hmm. so you can see that the kind of diagonal line that goes from the corner of our building and off to the right yeah that's a pride and, and again this is me drafting over a, a survey um, that's approximately where their driveway is. So their driveway is on our property currently. And if we were to build up to that property line, they wouldn't be able to get to their garage. We'd be essentially restricting or really cutting off unless they had a bicycle or a motorcycle or maybe a little Fiat, if I could stay with little Italy themes, mm -hmm. um, they could get back to their garage. So we're, we're trying to be good neighbors and be respectful of their access. So we're pulling the building um, between two and four feet off of their property so they can maintain um, access. I think that was the uh, Little, Italy, Little Italy Development, Redevelopment Corporations. Okay. Yeah, I understand the issue now. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's very nice that your layout accommodates your neighbor, even though they're encroaching on your property. So, uh, very good. Thanks for answering that question. Yeah. And as a side note, we're including masonry on those areas, so so we don't get the uh, so so the car takes more damage than the building if there's an incident. 
hope that doesn't sound insensitive, but frankly, that's it's, I think it's good practice. No, I understand. I have a investment property in Tremont and the neighbor's driveway is about eight foot wide and he takes out my vinyl fence on a regular basis. So I <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Ms. Bailey. Um, I like the project, um, how you're doing it. I just that just had to put that corner back on me. If you go back to that one elevation, it's just um, interesting how that um, how far out that balcony it is from the face of that um, building out to the edge of the balcony. The um, and then that's the one okay. unit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just, I'm sorry, the front balcony, the one on the front. Yeah, that, that front. Yeah, that. Yeah. That's uh I think that balcony is about six feet deep. It's 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 oh. it the face of okay. it matches the depth of the porch below. It's meant to cover oh. the entrance door and of that porch. Okay. <clears throat> right. It's it's just kind of odd looking, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else that you can do for that. But otherwise the whole project is fine I and mean, it's just great. I'm just wondering if it's, I mean, it's, it's already tight between the um, the property just you just discussed in your, it's not much you can do as far as putting landscape between the two for privacy. I mean, it's already a uh, limit back there between the two, so it's not much you can do as far as land, uh, landscaping. That's all my question. Thanks, Ms. Bailey. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Bailey. Uh, Mr. Brunges. I, I thank you, Madam Chair. I seem to recall when we were doing some initial research on the property involved in that driveway. Is there an easement or an access easement for your neighbor already in place? Or and can if there's not <clears throat> I think it should be, or it'd be advisable to actually get it memorialized and put into. Hmm. Yes, actually, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't believe there is a formal easement that's recorded. I did reach out to the uh, with that proposal to say, hey, let's let's write something up and, you know, make it official. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Bailey, your hand is still up. Or do you have additional comments? Ms. Bailey's hand is down. <laughs> Other questions or comments from the commission? Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if the applicant or, or the developer has uh, sat through other presentations, they understand the benefit of providing some context when you're presenting your project for formal approval. So I would suggest that you uh, spend some time and really document the adjacent properties, especially trying to address some potential concerns about the height of your project relative to the neighboring structures. Um, sure. Make sure you include sufficient context on both sides of the street uh, to really define how this new development will sit within the neighborhood. Okay. Well taken. Yes. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the commission? Since this was a uh, preliminary review uh, of the project, we're not taking a vote at this time. Does the applicant feel like you've received uh, adequate feedback to allow you to make some modifications uh, in return to us with your final? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's very helpful. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we look forward to seeing you back uh, at a future date um, related to the project. Thanks, Thanks again. again. That will conclude our uh, conceptual reviews for concept plan reviews for the, our meeting. It does not look like we have any. Um, do we have administrative reports today? I do not have a report. I do want to introduce Kevin Roberts, 
who's our new law department <coughs> representative. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to meet yet or to talk about what we do, but I'm hoping we can do that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Don. And thank you, uh, commission members. Um, I look forward to being with you on these Thursdays. And uh, I um, admire what you do and I'm impressed. And I hope that um, I could um, kind of step in where Drew Hastings uh, left. I won't replace him. I don't have a guitar to put behind me right now, but um, his institutional knowledge will be missing the law department. Uh, but uh, I think you'll like my enthusiasm and, um, and my uh, my love for the city and its landmarks and traditions and historical neighborhoods. So thank you and thank you, Don, for introducing me. Welcome. We're glad to have you join us. Um, and Mr. Hastings will be missed, Ian, but we're we're happy to have you join us and um, work with us moving forward. Appreciate that, Chair. Any other administrative reports, Don or Carl? Not that I know. Uh, I don't have a report. I just have a question. I know we sent out a lot of emails um, for this particular meeting. Was it helpful to have us sending the old uh, YouTube links to review um, the ones that we've already seen to put it back? And because I just want we need to get some feedback. What do you want to see more of when we have things coming back for after a concept or af after being tabled for a while? Carl, I think it's always helpful to be able to revisit what we've already reviewed uh, and compare that with the revised presentation. So I think, you know, having a, uh, a link to a past presentation is helpful, but if the applicants can be disciplined in including some of the uh, prior context with their up-to-date presentation so that they could toggle back and forth, I think that would be, from my perspective, that would be helpful. I would agree with what Bob said. I do like it. And I also like how you incorporated the dates of the concept plan re uh, reviews, just to remind ourselves, you know, when we reviewed it, um, you know, and, and just how much time, you know, has passed or not passed on some of these. And I would add not to be a burden to the commission, but for me, it's extremely helpful to give context to these new projects that I've never seen before, but the commission probably has. So I find it, uh, I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, Carl, just like Jonathan said, it was really helpful for me. I thought it was excellent. I needed it and I went, went through it, but, you know, I just needed to, you know, kind of own up for what you guys do. But I think moving forward, it'll be helpful. Um, for just um, resource on reference, quick reference. So thanks, Carl. And we will continue to do that. Excellent. All right, so if that concludes our administrative reports, do we have anything else on our agenda? Nope, just to adjourn. Then we will adjourn today's meeting and see everyone in two weeks, I believe. Is that <laughs> yeah. So Correct. Two, yeah. two weeks. Have a good holiday. Hey, everyone, have a good holiday. Bye, have a good holiday. holiday. Have a good holiday, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.